oh yay, oh yay. The Honorable, the Supreme Court of Texas. All persons having business before the Honorable, the Supreme Court of Texas are admonished to draw near and give their attention, for the court is now sitting. God save the state of Texas in this Honorable Court. Thank you. Be seated. This morning, the court has three matters on its oral submission docket. In the order of the presentation, they are as follows. Texas Department of Public Safety versus Melinda Petta from Nueces County, in which we have allotted 20 minutes for each side to present oral argument. And then three causes consolidated for the second oral argument, General Services Commission versus Little Tex Insulation Company from Travis County, Texas Department of Transportation versus Air Aerotron Incorporated from Travis County, and Texas A&M University and the Board of Regents of that school from versus Dalmac Construction Company Incorporated, also from Travis County. In that matter, we have allotted 25 minutes for each side to present argument. And finally, St. Joseph Hospital versus Stacy Lynn, Wolf, and others from Travis County, in which we have allotted 20 minutes. We will take a brief recess in between each argument, and we will complete these arguments in time for lunch. The court is meeting at the University of Texas for the first time, and uh, the recordings will be handled by the University of Texas. But if you wish an audio tape of any of these arguments, you may make application for our, uh, with our clerk at the Supreme Court building. If you would like to purchase a videotape of any argument, uh, please contact Hollis Levy at the University of Texas Law School. The court is ready to hear argument from petitioner in Texas Department of Public Safety versus PETA. Okay, please, the court. Ms. Julie Parsley will present argument from petitioner. Petitioners have reserved five minutes for <coughs> May it please the court. Melinda Petta was convicted of the crime of fleeing from a police officer. That conviction is final and valid. She now asks this court to allow her to bring a civil action that will essentially collaterally attack and call into question the correctness of that conviction. And unless the Court of Appeals judgment is reversed, she will succeed. Texas public policy will not allow Ms. Petta to shift the blame for her criminal conduct from herself to Officer Rivera. Likewise, the judicial principles underlying the pres preservation and finality of judgments will not allow her claim to go forward. <coughs> Counsel? Yes. Can we bifurcate the sequence of events and say that what happened before she left the scene may or may not be enough to sustain a cause of action aside from your sovereign immunity argument? No, Your Honor. Actually, the facts cannot be broken up in this case because the facts that she is presenting to this civil court are the same facts she presented to the criminal court. And the criminal court heard everything from the moment she was pulled over by Officer Rivera for the traffic stop until she pulled into the uh, But she was only charged with fleeing the scene of a stop, I guess is what you call it. Yes, eluding well, the police officer. So when does the <coughs> offense begin to occur? Well, the Court of Appeals held and incorrectly held that it, it severed, it cut off at the time she fled. But it's one continuum of facts. The jury, the criminal jury heard all the facts. They considered all the facts in reaching their verdict. And it cannot be broken up, the claim cannot be broken up at the time at the time that she fled because it seems to me couldn't someone who's arrested for a traffic stop and gets beaten by a police <coughs> officer have a claim for uh, assault or use of excessive force Certainly. and not be inconsistent with their their arrest for the traffic stop Certainly if they were not convicted of having assaulted that officer. Well, she wasn't convicted of assault. She was conflicted, convicted of fleeing, and the jury failed to um, accept her affirmative defense that, that her fleeing the officer was justified. So there's been no trial relating to the conduct of the police officer in any answer to the factual inquiry of whether or not he used excessive force. Isn't that correct? No, because the, his conduct was the centerpiece of her criminal action. 
her whole defense was that she had to flee because he was assaulting her and that the assault continued while she was fleeing, which is why she didn't stop. But even if those two, aren't we looking at different states of mind in these two criminal actions? You're looking at her state of mind, in these two actions, in the criminal action, we're looking at her state of mind, and now in this civil action, we'd be looking at his? It is true that there is a, that, that the criminal uh, action depended on her reasonable belief and that the civil act would be his intentional conduct. But his conduct was squarely put into question in the, in the criminal the action. But the jury never answered a question in that case with respect to his conduct specifically. He was not on trial. Isn't that correct? The jury charge read that if she believed, reason, reasonably believed that she was in fear of imminent bodily harm. So that means that based on that inquiry, his conduct was not the subject of a fact question that the jury was required to answer. But his conduct was resolved by the jury. It would have was to... His, was his conduct specifically the subject of a jury question in the criminal trial? His conduct was not mentioned in the, in the verdict. But if, it is, if it's his state of mind in the civil case, what he understood, as opposed to her state of mind in the criminal case, isn't there a different fact that's being tried in the civil case? No, Your Honor, because the issues are inextricably intertwined and have, were fully and fairly litigated in the criminal trial. Her necessity defense is a common law defense, and there's been some confusion on this issue. Ms. Petta alleges that the necessity defense is an affirmative defense, but it is actually a common law defense. If you have an affirmative defense, the burden is on the criminal defendant to both prove and to both put on evidence and prove that defense. However, when you have a, a common law defense, the criminal defendant is required to put on some evidence of the defense. The burden then shifts to the state to disprove that defense beyond a reasonable doubt. So her defense was fully and fairly litigated and was part of the underlying verdict that she was guilty of the crime. If the criminal verdict had gone differently, and let's say she had prevailed, would the state then be stopped in a um, civil proceeding? You could not contest liability? No, Your Honor. Actually, an acquittal does not propose a stopple. And there is a case that Ms. Petta has cited in, in other courts, the State versus Gonzales, where this court held in 1979, I believe, that an acquittal of a criminal action did not, was, did not work a stopple. But a guilty verdict will. This case is very similar to the Fifth Circuit's decisions in Sappington versus Barty and Hudson versus Hughes, and is really virtually factually indistinguishable from Hudson versus Hughes. In Hudson versus Hughes, an inmate during an arrest critically beat an officer and was charged and convicted of that offense. In his defense during that trial, he claimed self-defense, but he was still convicted. The jury rejected his self-defense claim. He later brought a 1983 action claiming that the officer had used excessive force against him in effecting the arrest. The Fifth Circuit held that because his civil, his civil contentions would work to undermine and put in question the validity of his conviction, that was barred. He could not collaterally attack his criminal conviction by putting it into question because a civil verdict could not exist in the same universe as the criminal conviction. What legal principle are you relying upon to say that there can't be a collateral attack? Collateral estoppel, res judicata, what collateral legal estoppel. principle? You're asking us to apply collateral estoppel. We're actually, what is the identity of issues that are at play in the criminal and civil action? The identity of issues is, the, is that she argued that his tortious acts caused her to believe that she was going to suffer imminent bodily harm. In the criminal trial, that was her showing. In the civil case, she would have to show that he knowingly and intentionally threatened to use imminent bodily harm. That sounds like two different issues to me. Why are they the same? They are the same because the same issues, the same exact conduct, the same exact issues are going to be decided for both. But the issue you described as to her talks about her state of mind and whether she was justified by what the officer did in fleeing. That's different than what's at issue here, which is the officer's state of mind and his conduct and how he dealt with her. It, how, can, how can those two things be the same when you are judging a different state of mind? 
In the civil context, it will be his intentional conduct. In the criminal context, it was just her reasonable belief. Arguably, the civil context, perhaps requiring her to prove his intentional conduct is a higher standard than her just putting forth evidence of the defense that she reasonably believed that he was threatening her. Let me focus your answer here. In a civil assault case, the plaintiff doesn't have to prove that they believed they were going to be assaulted. They only have to prove that the defendant took some action with the intent that they fear. Can't she try the entire civil case on simply what the police officer intended to do? And if the police officer attempted to bring in evidence about whether she reasonably believed or not would be irrelevant to the outcome of the case, wouldn't it? No, Your Honor, because she would have to, and this turns to the public policy issue. So you're saying it's a defense, I'm going to focus, you're saying it would be a defense to her assault claim if the defendant could show she really didn't believe she'd be assaulted? No, that would not be, well, he would, that would be part of, I suppose, a defense to, it would be a defense, I suppose, that she didn't reasonably believe, but that is not what the intentional act is going to look at. It's going to look at his intent as opposed to her reasonable belief, and that is true. But the fact issues were necessarily subsumed in the civil trial, and if the civil, I mean in the criminal trial, if the civil action goes forward and allows Melinda Pettit to put on evidence of her criminal act of fleeing and say, he made me do it, that will necessarily impugn the criminal verdict. And public policy will not allow her to shift the blame for her conduct from herself to him in a civil action. So the fact issues were subsumed in the criminal trial, but that's drawn by inference and perhaps by facts, not by any kind of thing in the verdict. The verdict found that she was guilty of the offense, that's correct, and that, but they had to necessarily reject her defense, which was based on his alleged assault. Why do you say they necessarily had to reject her defense, since there was no finding on it? If they believed, the way the jury charge read, if they believed, if they had a reasonable doubt that she had not, had fled because of his acts, they were to acquit her. But because if they believed the state disproved her defense beyond a reasonable doubt, they were to convict her, and they convicted her. But he still could have assaulted her, and the jury have found that she was not justified in fleeing. Isn't that correct? It doesn't mean there wasn't an assault, does it? It would, Your Honor, mean there wasn't an assault, because the jury's verdict has to be considered to be reasonable, and it would be difficult. What are the elements of an assault in a civil matter? They are essentially the same as they are in a criminal matter under the penal code. They are that the person intentionally or knowingly threatened the victim with imminent bodily harm, and therefore they are essentially the same. Her defense was that she reasonably believed that he was threatening her with imminent bodily harm. But the conviction and the civil trial cannot necessarily coexist in the same universe, because she is going to have to argue that her criminal acts were justified by what he did in the civil trial, which would impermissibly put in question her conviction. Ms. Parsley, let's assume that we reject your argument that collateral estoppel bars her claim. You also argue that under the public policy doctrine, her lawsuit should be barred. I'm concerned about the limits or the breadth of that kind of argument. What limits, if we were to adopt it, what limits should this court impose in embracing that kind of policy or argument? The same limits the court placed on it in Peeler, that if there is an adjudication of innocence or if the criminal conviction is found to be somehow invalid, it would not work an estoppel, that it could not be collaterally attacked by the civil judgment. This court has put an innocence requirement on the public policy defense, and it would be the same limit that we would argue here. Wouldn't that give the law enforcement officers carte blanche? I mean, someone could be guilty of a crime, but there could be excessive force used in the arrest. How would you distinguish those cases? Those cases could be distinguished by 
the question of whether the criminal defendant had been charged and convicted of assaulting the officer during the crime, during the arrest. What if they just fled, and in the course of they committed a crime, they fled, they were apprehended, but in the course of being apprehended, they were beaten by the police officers. Now, how would your, if we adopted your public policy defense, wouldn't we say that since they're guilty of a crime, they get what they deserve, basically? No, because they're not guilty of a crime that would call into question the excessive force used during the arrest. Their guilt would be dependent on whatever their crime initially was, the burglary, whatever. They're fleeing. They're fleeing, and they're apprehended, and they're beaten. Under your theory, wouldn't the state have no liability for excessive force? No. No, ma'am, not unless that the actual excessive force was what caused the defendant to flee, and then the criminal jury found that that was, and rejected that defense. It would be limited to these facts where the defense was squarely put in issue, fairly and fully litigated, and then found against the criminal defendant. Quickly turning to the Tort Claims Act, it does not waive sovereign immunity for the claims against Department of Public Services safety. The Tort Claims Act waives sovereign immunity only for certain acts, and it is limited in its waiver. It does not waive liability for intentional torts. The Court of Appeals avoided the intentional tort exception by construing the claims against DPS as arising from negligent conduct that preceded an intentional tort, trying to draw this case into line with the Delaney case. But this case is very different from the Delaney set of facts. So excessive force cases will always be intentional torts and will always be protected by the Tort Claims Act? No. No, Your Honor, that's no. Where do you draw the line? Well, she is not claiming excessive force. She's claiming an assault and battery, which is specifically exempted. If she had brought a valid 1983 claim for excessive force, she would show that her constitutional right had been violated and that he had caused that violation. And if it were an excessive force case, how would it fall out under the Tort Claims Act? I see I've run out of time. May I answer? You may, please. The excessive force claim under the Tort Claims Act would not – well, it would depend on the employee's negligence. If he had committed an intentional act, then it would not be permissible under the Tort Claims Act. The remedy would be under Section 1983 against that officer. I'm just trying to figure out, in the run-of-the-mill case like this, if you can call these run-of-the-mill cases, how they are to be prosecuted in the future. If somebody is subjected to what could be categorized as excessive force or assault and battery, if somebody is beat by a police officer, there seems to be that they should have some right of recovery. And the question is, what avenue is pursued to do that? Which leads to the question is, to what extent does the Tort Claims Act cloak the governmental entity with protection? And so if you could answer that to the broader context of these cases, whenever there is conduct like this in general, how does the Tort Claims Act provide a shield to the governmental entity? Is it your contention that it always would? Or are you saying that there would be some exceptions? It would depend on the facts of the case. If the employee's conduct was intentional, and it was an intentional assault and battery, the Tort Claims Act would not waive liability in that case. So by saying that, you're saying that there can be some assault and batteries that are not intentional? No, I apologize if that's what I said. That's not what I meant to say. The assault and battery, if it was an assault and battery, if it was unreasonable force and was found to be assault, then it would not waive sovereign immunity under the Tort Claims Act. If, however, it was negligent conduct or something that was lesser than the intentional act, then it possibly could subject the governmental unit to liability under the Tort Claims Act. But the Tort Claims Act clearly does not waive sovereign immunity for the assault, for assault or battery on behalf of the employee. Now, the employee might personally be liable in their individual capacity for the assault and battery. And that is always possible because it's difficult to see how they would have official immunity for that act. But the governmental entity is not going to be liable for that intentional conduct. Any other questions? Thank you, Counsel. The Court is ready to hear argument from Respondent. 
Mr. Mayor, um, what was Ms. Pettit convicted of? She was convicted of fleeing or attempting to elude a, a police officer, which is a misdemeanor. And isn't that a continuum? It wasn't fleeing the scene. It was, it was fleeing all the way until she got to her driveway, correct? I, I wouldn't agree that it was con a continuum. I believe that you could look at the, these in sec you, you could look at this particular incident in separate discrete parts. For instance, uh, in order for her to be convicted, she has to actually be fleeing or attempting to elude the officer. Well, that's what I'm her, saying. Her I mean, accident occurred prior. Until she went in, in, entered her driveway, she was fleeing the entire time. That, that is correct. She was fleeing the entire time. And so that whole continuum was an offense. That is correct. Well, it, then that would make the distinction the CA, the Court of Appeals, drew in this case invalid, wouldn't it? Because didn't the Court of Appeals presume that the offense occurred at the scene and that after that there was a discrete segment in time that it presumes was not part of the offense. I'm not sure if that's what the Court of Appeals held or not as far as when they decided the particular incident occurred as far as the fleeing. But if they drew that type of distinction, you would think that would be invalid then? Th that's correct. Okay. Mr. Mount, I, I'm having a hard time understanding or finding the waiver of sovereign immunity here. Can we talk about that? Where is the waiver in the statute? We certainly can. And under the Texas Tort Claims Act, we have Section 101.021, 1 and 2, dealing with tangible property and a motor-driven vehicle also. The instruments that he used uh, with Ms. Petta, the nightstick, the gun that he also used, and the vehicle that he used. Weren't all these intentional acts? As, as far as we're concerned, these, these either could have been intentional acts or they could have been negligent acts. We're not sure at this particular point in time. How can you time. be negligent taking your nightstick and beating it on the window of a car? Of the, of a, of a car? That was Melinda's contention that he was beating the nightstick on the vehicle. However, the officer's contention, though, was that, that he was tapping it on the, on the car. So but Assume we agree with you. Assume we say, okay, well, you can put all this into the category of negligence. All your client has claimed are emotional injuries, and there is no cause of action in Texas for negligent infliction of emotional distress. So don't you lose under a negligence theory? I, I believe that um, in Texas under the Transportation Code, uh, th there's a duty on behalf of the police officers to uh, drive with the due regard or safety of motorists on the road. So there's, a, there's been a legal duty that's, cr that's been created. But there's no injury. There, we don't recognize in Texas a cause of action for negligent infliction of emotional distress. So if, if we assume you're correct, hasn't your client only alleged emotional injuries? Absent another legal duty, though, there is a legal, there is a legal duty under the uh, Texas Transportation Code which would allow us to bring this particular claim. It would be the breach of that particular duty that would allow this negligent infliction of emotional distress type of claim. Do you have any authority for that proposition? Yes, I do. That was, it was cited in the first PETA opinion, the 96 opinion. Why is that statute any different from a common law uh, breach of, of duty? Why should we say there's no cause of action for emotional distress for a breach of a common law duty, but for some reason we should say the statute reaches a different result or causes a different result? Well, I, I believe it's because we have a statute involved. We, have, we, we actually have a legal duty that's created versus uh, what we have under the common law. So it's your position that every time there's a violation of a statute, you can recover for emotional injuries? Yes, in this particular instance, as far as the violation of this particular statute, I would say yes, but uh, as far as other statutes, uh, we would have to look at that, those particular statutes. Mr. Mount, the, yeah, there's a Fifth Circuit case, I guess, Sappington, I think is the name of it, um, and it really doesn't talk in terms of, of collateral estoppel. Um, it really just talks in terms of whether or not the, a decision in the civil case would be inconsistent with the decision in the criminal case. And so how could um, Ms. Petta's judgment against Officer Rivera for assault against her, assuming she gets a judgment against him, for assault not establish that she was justified to be fleeing from him? How could, how could that not establish her justification in fleeing? 
Well, I think that the definition of assault, we have three different types of assault, that the assault definition is much broader than the necessity instruction that was given in our particular case. In our particular criminal case, the necessity instruction was, was tied to the flight. So I believe that we have a, a, a narrower So you're arguing that at some discrete point in time, he could have assaulted her, but the assault would have been such that she would not have otherwise been justified in fleeing. I, I, I believe, I believe that's right. Which point in fleeing the police officer would she have not been justified in fleeing if he had assaulted her? Could you repeat that question? I'm, I'm trying to, the, the state's position is you're trying to create a discrete event. He shot at the car and that was an assault. And, uh, therefore to find that that was an assault would not be inconsistent with the finding that she wasn't justified in fleeing the officer. The state says you can't do that. You can't separate those. So I'm asking now to, to give me the point in time that the police officer could have assaulted her, but she would not have been justified in fleeing a police officer. If, if you look at the issue, she, she was, she was shot at prior to being flee, uh, fleeing. Uh, she wasn't participating in that particular time. If I was just sitting time. in my car and all of a sudden somebody started shooting at me, I think I'd flee. So how is that not justification for fleeing? We're not sure what was in her mind at the, at the time, whether that's what caused her to flee, whether it was that particular shot that caused her to flee or whether it was some other event that, that occurred at the time that caused her to flee. We're not sure what, what, the, what the finding is in that area. But isn't that kind of critical in this case? Isn't, isn't the argument you make is that there could have been an assault occurring that would not have justified her fleeing the police officer. And so wouldn't it be critical to identify when that assault occurred so that you could determine that it's not inconsistent with the jury's determination she wasn't justified in fleeing? It, it, in this particular case, we don't, we don't know what it was, though, that caused her uh, to decide to flee. We, 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 just, we just don't know that. Well, can a jury, let me, let's assume the jury finds civil assault, an intentional event that the police officer commits with the intent to harm her, and the, and the jury says, yes, that occurred, and here's the damages. I mean, wouldn't, if that all occurred, if all those elements were proven, wouldn't the person who was assaulted have a reasonable belief that, that they were being assaulted? If you prove that this was intentional and intended to do that, when, wouldn't you have a reasonable belief that you were going to be assaulted? I believe so, yes. And so, how is the civil judgment not inconsistent with the criminal conviction that said she wasn't justified in fleeing? Well, the, the, the civil judgment uh, just limits, uh, or actually the, it was the finding of the criminal court that if Melinda believed her flight was necessary to avoid imminent harm, that belief was not reasonable. It didn't, it didn't foreclose uh, a jury finding that she wasn't harmed by what he was doing, or it, it doesn't mean that he didn't do what he said he did, that he chased her at a high speed, that he shot at her, that he used his night, nightstick on her. Uh, it doesn't mean that he didn't scare her to death. Um, and it doesn't mean that he wasn't negligent. Um, if he was scaring her to death, she didn't have a reasonable fear of imminent harm? That, that is only in context, that would be in context with the flight, with, with the flight only. I think you have to limit... I don't understand that answer. If, she, if he was scaring her to death, she didn't have a reasonable fear of imminent harm, wherever it occurred. That would be only, right, it would, but, but it would only be in connection with the flight, not, not what occurred. Uh, I, I believe prior to the prior to her fleeing. Well, how can that be? I believe just what, what you're looking at is under that necessity instruction. That's just a much narrower instruction than what you have under under the. In your brief, you say for Ms. Petta to have been found not guilty, the criminal jury would have had to have found that Ms. Petta reasonably believed that her flight was immediately necessary to avoid imminent harm. I think that's right. And a corollary to that is, since the jury found uh, that she was guilty, it had to find beyond a reasonable doubt, right? 
it had to find beyond a reasonable doubt. That's correct. The burden was on the prosecution to, that her flight was not immediately necessary to avoid imminent harm. Now, how could they find that if he was doing any of the things that you're going to claim he was doing in the civil action? Well, I believe the jury did not believe the jury didn't believe that her flight was necessary to avoid imminent harm. That doesn't again, it doesn't mean that uh, Melinda wasn't harmed. She wasn't being harmed by this officer, or she wasn't in harm's way at the time. It's just that uh, it w her flight wasn't necessary to avoid that imminent harm. Again, it doesn't mean that, that she wasn't harmed, that she wasn't injured at all. So he was beating on her window with the stick. He was shooting at her, but she didn't have any reasonable belief to, to, that she was in danger. No, I think she, she did have a reasonable belief that she was in danger when she was being beaten upon him at that particular point in time. And criminal jury said that beyond a reasonable doubt, she did. But again, they tie it to her flight also. They, they again, it's tied to the flight. Uh, let, let me, I'm, I want to make sure I understand your position. Are you just suing for the pre-flight conduct of Rivera or conduct that goes beyond the flight? We're suing for the entire conduct. Would you go back to the immunity question? Uh, is the basis of your argument that you get a waiver of immunity because of your assertion this is negligent use of tangible personal property? Is that correct? That, that's correct. And also, is that the only basis for waiver? We believe that the property, the, the property was used negligently, but also if there was a finding by the jury that this uh, property was used intentionally, we believe that the DPS could have still been responsible for what occurred on that particular day. That is, the DPS could <coughs> still be responsible for their own negligent acts under the Sheridan versus United States case and also uh, this court's authority in Delaney versus City of Houston. Um, we believe that uh, the DPS was negligent in allowing this incident to occur, uh, allowing this, this chase to escalate the way it did. There's evidence in the file that reflects that uh, one of the superiors who investigated this incident afterwards says that maybe this chase sh should have been broken off. The DPS had, uh, at the time of the chase, they had her driver's license and all the information necessary to identify this particular lady and, well, and pick her fact, up at another time. But in fact, didn't DPS instruct the officer not to do what he did? So ha again, how could DPS be negligent in implementing its policies if it followed them and specifically instructed the officer? D DPS did not ask the officer to break off the chase or any of the other officers to break off the chase. The only thing the DPS asked him to do was not to shoot at her particular vehicle, which evidently he violated that particular order and did okay, shoot. Okay, let's limit it to that then. Surely that would be covered by immunity. I mean, th there can be no negligence in failing to follow the, or implement their policies if they instructed him not to shoot. He, he felt like that uh, when that order was given that the situation had changed at that particular point in time, and so he... Uh, Possibly the order wasn't clear enough that under no circumstance should you shoot at this particular vehicle. Because apparently he didn't shoot uh, right after that order was given, but at a later point in time when he felt like it was okay to shoot. So there might have been some ambiguity as far as that particular order was But if we concerned. applied that reasoning, wouldn't the exception swallow the rule if we can always craft some sort of negligence claim for negligent implementation of policy when what clearly is an intentional act on his behalf? I don't agree with that statement because in this particular case, again, you've got tangible personal property involved, so you do have a limitation. You've got, you know, you've got um, this property that's being used. Uh, if we argue that it was being used intentionally, um, the point of the matter was that this, this particular individual um, uh, may have, may well, the other the argument the other argument that we have in in uh, in our briefing materials, I believe, is that he wasn't properly trained. Uh, by the DPS, which he evidently wasn't trained. In well, but using, how can you get that instance, under also. negligent use of tangible personal property well, when they, no personal property per se is involved in training? Or how does that couple to get you a waiver? Well, there, there is a nexus between the property and that he, he needs to be trained in the use of his vehicle. He needs to be trained in the use of, of his nightstick and his gun as to how to handle these, these items and when to use them. Uh, in, in civil litigation, you have situations where you might entrust or give to someone your vehicle that you know is not qualified to drive that particular vehicle. Uh, 
he might deliberately go out and run a red light. Well, but that responsible for that. That analogy doesn't work because in negligent entrustment of a motor vehicle, you have to show actual knowledge of the uh, poor driving record or whatever. And so how can you couple that with the claim negligent supervision can get you to negligent use of tangible personal property to get the waiver? If you have knowledge that this particular person, uh, Officer Rivera, was not trained, was not properly trained concerning these particular items, then well, you're negligent I, in allowing him to go out and use these. Thus far, that's merely a, an allegation. There's no evidence to that effect. Is that right? Well, there's there's evidence out there that reflects that they gave him additional training afterwards because they felt like apparently that he well, but had that's not significant it, enough training. In that beforehand. remedial, it, it could be steps, remedial. Is that admissible? Could be remedial, but it also could be an, an acknowledgement of the fact that uh, he hadn't been properly trained in the first place. I believe also his personnel file reflects that there were other instances of where uh, there was rude behavior on his, his part. Uh, perhaps he should have had more training at that particular time when those other incidences developed. Mr. Mount, let's assume that he was given the best training available and, and he still acted in the manner that he did. What would, would the result be different? Would you still be making a claim against EPS? As far as the training claim goes, I believe we wouldn't be because it wouldn't be foreseeable that this particular incident would occur. But if you have an unqualified officer out there using these particular items, then we believe it is foreseeable that something like this could happen. The last thing I'd like to touch on is also the, the public policy issue. We believe that that policy issue, that public policy is a very narrow doctrine that uh, should not be applied in this particular case. Uh, the, the key Let me in this ask you on, on, in that regard, you agree that, do you agree that in Sappington they're really talking about a public policy concern as opposed to collateral estoppel? <coughs> in other words, the, the issue that's addressed is not that collateral estoppel prevents the uh, plaintiff, Ms. Pettit, in this case, from relit relitigating issue, but it's really a public <coughs> policy concern that the issues are so closely intertwined that one necessarily means you couldn't have had the other. I, I, I would I would agree with that. And then you're per, you're proceeding to argue that that's a very narrow issue that doesn't apply here. Well, I, I'm, what I'm trying to argue is that public policy, I believe, is much narrower than the collateral estoppel uh, type of doctrine. In in the public policy arena, it, in this particular doctrine, uh, we don't believe that Melinda Petta contributed in any way to her injury. That is her her fleeing contributed in any way to uh, what Rivera did to her. So so we believe that uh, public policy wouldn't apply in this particular case. Rivera beat on her vehicle, evidently he shot at her. All these were acts by Rivera towards her uh, that, that didn't have anything to do with her illegal act. And then, and then also concerning the public policy doctrine, you have incidents, you have matters that occurred prior to her fleeing also. Let me ask you about that. If, if she flees, I mean, I understand she wants to talk about certain discrete events, but the police officer comes, uh, stops her, uh, she decides that there's something wrong here, and she drives away. Now, the police officer has the authority to take reasonable steps to apprehend her, correct? So isn't she, in fact, creating the circumstance that then calls upon the police officer to start exercising discretion to arrest and apprehend? I don't necessarily agree. I believe he should have acted properly under that particular circumstance. Uh, the officer apparently didn't do that in this well, instance. Well, if he'd acted appropriately under the circumstance, he would have had the authority to, to stop and apprehend her. That's correct. So is she not contributing to her injury by initiating a sequence of events that escalates. I don't believe so because it's his conduct towards her that, that we see in this particular instance. It's his conduct that needs to be addressed. In the context of his apprehending her. He's, he stopped her for a traffic event. She flees. He apprehends her. She argues that this is that a number of these factors are assaults but you don't perceive her fleeing as initiating any of those sequences. 
no i don't because it's again we're looking at his conduct towards her we're not looking at her particular act she's not contributing to the to the incident through her illegal conduct any other questions thank you counsel thank you Let me ask you the converse of a question I asked you earlier. What if her civil case had gone to trial first and she had prevailed? Would she be acquitted on the criminal charge? Would she have established her necessity defense? That would have, it would have come in, it could have come in at the criminal trial, probably as an impeachment of his evidence, of his testimony, but it would not have necessarily compelled a result in the criminal trial. The collateral estoppel applying from criminal to civil has been held to apply from criminal to civil, but I'm unaware of any cases where it's applied from civil back to criminal again. So under your argument, it's really just a one-way street. There's no way, I mean, that undercuts your argument, doesn't it, that they're inextricably intertwined and a decision on one precludes a decision on the other? Well, let me rephrase my answer. I am not aware of any case where it has gone the other way, and so the courts, as far as I know, have not held that, but the principles would be the same. They are still inextricably intertwined. At a minimum, her acquittal, I mean, her civil conviction would come in to impeach whatever testimony he would have, if not to come in to show that she had been assaulted. So I think that that would be possible, but I don't know of any cases. But you're not going to allow it to go the other way from criminal to civil. You're saying in your argument that as a matter of law, it just stops without having the opportunity for the state to come in and impeach her civil action by saying, well, here's what the jury found over there. It's just a legal question rather than an evidentiary question if it goes the other way. I think that's what Justice O'Neill is getting at. Under our arguments, that would be true. However, the Heck v. Humphrey line of cases, Sappington and Hudson, apply the basic premise of collateral estoppel of not letting the criminal judgment be attacked by a civil judgment without requiring an exact identity of issues. And so there is also that line of cases that would support our argument, as well as public policy, which although the Court of Appeals and Ms. Petta argue she was not a willing participant in her injuries, that language is taken from the Gulf case, which was a totally different circumstance. In that case, a gambler was suing his landlord for some damage to his property. The landlord argued that the gambler could not bring the civil action because the gambler was engaged in illegal conduct. This court... Excuse me. I understood the argument to be following the Heck case and Sappington, where the evidence of the case had to do with the defendant assaulting a police officer and this police officer using force to subdue the defendant, and the defendant brings an assault claim, and the court saying, but since the police officer is authorized to take the steps necessary, one of the factors is that the defendant contributed to the defendant's own injuries. Correct. And so that was a common thread in the Sappington-type cases. That's correct. Mr. Mount now argues on behalf of Ms. Petta that she was just driving down the road. There was a dispute over how fast she was going, but the police officer immediately pounced on her and threatened her and was beating on her window, and that was an event that occurred without her contributing to the injury, and therefore the public policy of Sappington, Heck, should not apply in this case. But it should apply because Sappington and Hudson are almost identical to this set of facts. That's exactly what the defendants in those, well, the plaintiff in the civil actions tried to allege, is that they didn't do anything wrong. They were pounced on. Excessive force was used against them during the arrest, and that's what caused the action. That's what caused them to have to react to the police officer and beat the police officer. It's exactly the same set of facts here. She will have to rely on her illegal acts in her civil trial to prove her civil cause of action. She will have to say, I fled because he assaulted me. And her 
excuse for fleeing in the civil action will necessarily impugn her conviction in the criminal. How does she have to prove anything about her fleeing in connection with the civil action? She has to prove that he intentionally and knowingly threatened her with imminent bodily harm. And her set of facts from this... I understand, but why does she have to... You just said that she has to prove that she fleed because she was in fear of bodily harm. Why would she have to prove anything about her flight in connection with the civil action? Because her assault claims continue past the flight and through the chase. Her claims encompass the entire continuum of facts from the time she stopped, she fled during the flight and the time she was apprehended. Ms. Parsley, if the officer had been convicted of criminal assault, would he be stopped from re-litigating the issue of whether he had assaulted her in a civil action by her? Yes. I have one more question for you. If we decide that DPS is entitled to sovereign immunity, do we reach collateral estoppel? The DPS immunity does not necessarily encompass Rivera's... the claims against Rivera in his individual capacity, although under 101-106 of the Tort Claims Act, he would be entitled to judgment. But DPS and Rivera in his individual capacity did not assert that in the summary judgment. That's my question. That issue would not really be before us. It would be more advisory if we wrote on collateral estoppel in that context, correct? Not necessarily, because the case can be disposed of either way. The entire case can be disposed of as on collateral estoppel or public policy, and then the DPS claims against DPS and Rivera in his official capacity would be resolved in the Tort Claims Act context, which would then require a showing under 101-106, and Rivera would get a judgment in his individual capacity. Any other questions? Thank you, counsel. That concludes the argument in the first cause. We'll take a brief recess. Please rise. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Court is ready to hear all arguments from petitioners in all these cases. One moment, please. Keep that clock running. You're just expecting such a stirring argument. We want to be prepared. Are you ready to listen? I'm all ears. May it please the court. Federal sign was not unanimous, but the members of this court unitedly expressed their hope or expectation that the legislature would act to alleviate the perceived unfairness of a strong sovereign immunity doctrine. Last year, after 12 years of debate in the legislature, and perhaps partly in response to federal sign, the legislature did act. It enacted an administrative claims process that preserves the state's sovereign immunity from suit, but creates an equitable and fair way for parties to resolve their contract disputes with the state before seeking legislative consent to sue. Now that the legislature has acted, the court should not, and we think may not, impose a waiver by conduct exception to the state's sovereign immunity. So how should all of these cases be resolved then? These cases should be resolved by reversing the court of appeals and sending them back with instructions that they be dismissed. 
Assuming we don't act, shouldn't we uh, implement a uh, mental competency test for anybody who would be stupid enough to enter into a contract with the state? <laughs> uh, and and I, I say that not being facetious. I'm serious. Why, isn't there a very strong public policy argument against your position because somebody would be a fool to enter into a contract with an entity that can say, well, I'll pay you maybe, I probably won't pay you. There's no obligation under your argument for the political entity to, to have to pay. I think not, Justice Abbott. In the vast, vast majority of contracts, these types of issues don't arise. These particular claims, there are, well, I think, good faith here. disputes. We've got a whole bunch of people here where it has arisen. For one, for another, let me ask you this. How many times has the legislature approved payment? Until or 1987, they almost always did. Since that, until, I guess, 1998 or 99, it was about nine times out of 173. So the track record is not good. But, but despite the public policy arguments that existed at the time this court decided federal sign, they don't exist anymore because the legislature has enacted 2260 and it applies not only to contracts that are entered into the future, but to all claims pending at the time of the effective date. So if those cases were still in existence, they now have an administrative remedy. They can seek. I want to ask you about that. I want to ask you specifically your view of the statute. Is anything that we do here today relevant? Even if the court were to abolish sovereign immunity, wouldn't this statute govern uh, notwithstanding what we say? Wouldn't you have to go through the administrative claims proceeding and still get permission to see whether we abolish sovereign immunity or not? Well, that's exactly our argument. My, my basic understanding... Is that your position on the statute? I didn't get that yes. in your briefs. I want to... No, it, it is in the briefs. It, it may not have been as, as lucid as I would like to have been. But our position is when the legislature acts in the area of sovereign immunity, for instance, in the Tort Claims Act or here, it doesn't only, let's just take the, uh, the Tort Claims Act. When that was enacted, it didn't only waive sovereign immunity for certain claims, but it legislatively codified or adopted both sides of the line that it drew. And all the courts in Texas for 30 years have understood that when you bring a claim under that act, if you don't fit within the language of the act, you are barred by sovereign immunity and this court, neither this court nor the courts of appeals have ever thought, well, we'll just abolish the rest of sovereign immunity because the legislature didn't see fit to waive it. This act, chapter 2260, took a different tack. It said we're not going to abolish sovereign immunity from suit in the district courts. We're going to leave it intact, but instead, we're going to do what a number of other uh, states have done as you recognize, Justice Enoch, in your dissent, and that is to set up what is essentially a claims commission. We're going to use the SOA process. We're going to send them through an administrative process where they can have negotiation and mediation. If they don't like the result of that, they can ask for a contested case adjudication. And I think that it is eminently fair to those who contract with the state. Reading it, it seems almost unfair to the state. When you go into that contested case adjudication, once the ALJ decides and issues findings of fact and conclusions of law, if they go against the state and that claim is valid, it says the state doesn't get any appeal from that. But that's only up to $250,000. That's right. Up to $250,000, then you pay. If it's over $250,000, let's look at what happens then. The ALJ files the findings of fact and conclusions of law with the ledge, and they ask for an appropriation. And then the legislature gets to do an appropriation. But as this court recognized in federal sign, you don't get anything really more than that going to trial and getting a judgment against the state. You still have to go to the legislature to get the appropriation to pay it. Do so the have, only difference- Under the uh, current, under that statute, the new statute, do you have to get an appropriation for a claim that is approved under $250,000? If the agency has funds appropriated for the payment of that contract or for contract claims generally, then there's no appropriation. The statute says shall pay. The state shall pay if it's under $250,000.
the vast majority of contract claims are for less than that. So if the ALJ thinks the state should pay, it doesn't have any appeal. It just pays if there were funds appropriated for that contract, and the case is over. Unless, unless the contracting party decides it doesn't like that result. So what happens to the $30 million recreational facility? Well, remember, we paid almost all of that. We're only talking about the overages here. Which is how much? Which they're claiming something on the order of $3 million, I believe. Well, so so it would be over. over the Absolutely. And in fact, they protectively filed with SOA. The SOA proceedings were ongoing, and they've been stayed pending the outcome of this case. So DALMAC can go back. If they get dismissed, they can go back and go through the SOA procedure. Can all of these private contractors go back through the SOA process? Are any of them barred under the terms of the statute? I think there's an issue as to little tax. Air Aerotron did file a 2260 claim. I'm not sure that little tax did. I think they decided to roll the dice and take their gamble on their lawsuit. Well, that, if I recall, that case is the only one that the Court of Appeals discussed the 2260 issue, and that was in a footnote, interestingly enough, wasn't it? That's correct. The timing of it was that those cases had been pending in front of the Court of Appeals when the legislature was considering it and then enacted 2260. But our base position is that it is now enacted. It is the law, and the legislature intended it by saying that it would apply to all pending claims, that it intended that it apply to these claims. Well, then, when you're asking the court to reverse all three of them, send them back to the trial court to dismiss so the three claimants can file under 2260, but one of them can't. Is that correct? So they have no way to get relief. The statute sets out time limits for filing a SOA claim, a 2260 claim. It also provided a backdoor for claims that had been going on so that you had 180 days after the effective date of the act to file. I don't know why they chose not to file. The other litigants did. Perhaps there's an argument they have that if this is dismissed, maybe they've got a claim on why they should then be able to file. That can be handled in the SOA proceeding once they file. What we're asking this court to do, though, is acknowledge that in federal sign, you asked the legislature to act, and they did. They did. They acted responsibly. The court struggled, I know, in federal sign with the fact that the legislature hadn't done anything, and it was perceived to be unfair. But they had been working for eight years at that time unsuccessfully, and now they have opted. They've gone through all of those debates, and they have opted. But isn't there a public policy reason why maybe this ball should not stay in the legislature's court? And that is, what is the sole remedy for somebody who has entered into a contract with the state that the state does not want to pay? That the sole remedy is to approach the legislature, is it not? And get the legislature to approve payment. Well, if it's less than 250, there will be no contact with the legislature under 2260. Okay, but over 250. If it's over 250, ultimately, the ALJ will make a recommendation. So any concerns that they won't be paid are basically a distrust that the legislature won't make appropriations based on the ALJ recommendation, perhaps more than they did when there were actual judgments. And there's not a history of when there's judgments and the recommendation is made of the legislature simply refusing. They may not grant permission, or at least for the past 12 years, they may not. Well, here's my concern, and you're making some argument to alleviate it to some extent. But the concern, I think, is obvious, and that is that people who are entities that enter into big contracts with the state are going to be forced to getting the legislators around the state to go ahead and agree to pay up, which creates an uncomfortable situation of legislators asking these folks for campaign contributions and then wind up deciding to go ahead and pay up on the bill. I think that creates bad public policy. 
I think we're presuming that bad actions will take place. I will say that for highway construction projects, this has been the process for a long time. It's in, um, I think, 211 of the Transportation Code. For highway construction projects, this type of SOA process, um, at least going through the APA, has long been. So they have not had access to the courts for quite some time. Uh, What's your response to all the red on this chart? <coughs> I, I'm glad. Th this is a really nice chart that they've prepared, and it talks about what states have done. But, but let me make two points about this chart. First, as you can see, nearly every state has provided some mechanism for resolving contract disputes with the state. But no state, no state has done it by adopting a waiver by conduct exception to sovereign immunity. Second point I'd like to make about the chart. In the states in which the legislature has acted to provide that mechanism, again, you don't see a history. In no state has the judiciary come in and said, we don't like what you, the legislature, have done in drawing these lines, so we're just going to judicially abrogate the whole thing. So go I, going back to the chart, two things. One is that for all the red states, uh, there was no legislative action taken. No, that, that's not clear to me. Um, in federal sign, the court pointed out that there are really relatively few in which there was an out-and-out out judicial abrogation. Again, I don't know the cases behind all of these red splotches. It says judicially abrogated or found not to apply, and I'm not sure the exact definition. Again, that's not my chart. But in federal sign, the concurrence said only five judicially abrogated. The dissent cited four cases for that general proposition, but, but they didn't cite any cases saying when the legislature acts, why we'll just reject that and abrogate it completely because we don't like the line the legislature's drawn. But doesn't this exhibit help you in a way? Because it, it, I mean, the, the it does. legislature looked at all these different states and crafted a policy in response to what the other states have done. Yes, absolutely. I think it helps me a lot in that. I'm just saying that uh, whatever the states have done, our legislature has chosen a direction to go. It has opted. One of the options that the Justice Enoch offered in his dissent um, that would be similar to the Contract Disputes Act that the federal government enacted, I think clearly that's a legitimate way to go. The legislature has done that, and this court ought to give that a chance to succeed. We've said that uh, sovereign immunity is a common law doctrine that the courts uh, have established. Um, can the legislature claim sovereign immunity uh, by statute? Well, I, I think that they clearly could. I think that they, they clearly can define um, various causes of action. There has not been a recognized claim against, for instance, the state. So for, let me Would give an example. Would they have to have a rational basis for doing so? Could they, could they claim sovereign immunity for all claims brought by road contractors, but not uh, claims brought by anybody else. I, I think I'll concede that there has to be a rational basis uh, for that. That would be true whether it was contract or tort? Well, I think the courts have said that any legislative enactment has to have some rational basis. Uh, and there, there, is, there is no separation of powers or other constitutional problem with one branch of government immunizing itself? Well, sovereign immunity I mean, we've, we've talked about it in the sense of it being recognized by the courts, but I think sovereign immunity pre-existed our, our state constitution. I mean, that's what the federal courts have said, and the judiciary has simply recognized that it didn't have power to go against the state. Now, there's been a movement against that because of fairness concerns, and, and we're not saying that that's not a good thing. Well, nor are you saying that we don't have the power to do it. You're just saying we shouldn't do it. That's right, and I think that's what the court recognized in federal sign. Um, I mean, I read some of the opinions of federal sign to basically be a, be a plea to the legislature to act, and I think that they've done that. And but when we talk they, here, they, they didn't go very far. <laughs> I, I disagree I mean the, with that. The federal government has an uh, administrative process that you can opt in or opt out of. You can sue, appeal. It has all sorts of ways to get your claim adjudicated depending on how you want to go about it. We have this one very narrow uh, statute now. Well, it, it's probably not as broad as 
what's available but that was the legislature's decision to make and i think that that our process is at least as broad as as some others that are available and they were dealing with the policy um, issues that you pointed out in your concurrence in federal sign they've been going through that for years and years i mean as long as the chief has been on the bench they've been working with that and they've made a decision well, and we ought to give it a chance on, on, in that regard um, waiver by conduct and, and all of this. Suppose that in federal sign, they had actually delivered the sign. They had built it and actually delivered the sign. And the state said, whoops, unless you get permission, you can't sue us and recover. Doesn't that implicate some constitutional concerns? Not the least of which is taking somebody's property without paying for it? Well, it, it would be a bad thing. I don't think it would be a takings claim. The courts have thus far unanimously rejected uh, the takings analysis. I mean, we've de been About dealing Idaho. with contracts. Don't they cite Idaho in your brief? Or? Well, the Texas courts is what I mean oh, to say, sorry. Chief Justice. The, there have been some states that have gone that way. But the Texas courts, looking at what it takes to establish a takings in Texas, have said no. And, and I think at this late day and age, to come back and back end it, um, I think would be unwise for the court to do that. Nobody's ever thought that a contract claim was a taking. Well, I suggest that maybe until federal sign, not too many people here thought that the state really wasn't bound by its contract. And so perhaps the takings claims never really got aired by an argument that, wait a minute, We've delivered the supplies and the materials, and now you say you don't, we got, you don't have to pay us. So I would that issue just now come to the fore. I would suggest exactly to the contrary, Justice Enoch, that before federal sign, everybody knew that you couldn't sue the state unless you went to the legislature and got <coughs> permission to sue from them. You got a resolution. And until 1987, that, that worked very well. I don't know why the legislature stopped doing that in 1987. But you don't see a lot of cases, not because uh, there weren't disputes, but because the legislature granted them in resolutions and people understood that and knew it. And there wasn't a lot of case law because people weren't filing in district court. They knew where to go and they got their relief that way. There was a 13-year hiatus in the fairness issues and there wasn't, seemingly wasn't a good uh, remedy for people. Now there is. Now there is. Let's give it a chance. I'd like to say that there are a lot of issues with the waiver by conduct. I've said that no other state has adopted it. I think federal sign addressed all the policy issues as to a general abrogation, and I think that the statute prevents that from happening now. Waiver by conduct is not something that's been adopted by other states. It creates exactly the same kind of definitional problems that courts have dealt with in the Tort Claims Act is where do we draw the line? If we go that route, we'll be litigating what conduct waives sovereign immunity for at least a decade. Why well, can't I, the bright line just be executed as opposed to executory contracts? But that's what this court rejected in federal sign. And I think the court ought to think twice, once, before going well, back in well, federal sign. Second. In federal sign, we didn't deal with an executed contract. I thought it was an executed contract. It well, simply hadn't been performed. It was, well, that's what, it was not performed. Why can't we draw the line between performance? Well, partial performance, full performance, nobody can really know. But I would say the legislature has acted, and we ought to respect what they've done. Any other questions? Thank you, counsel. Court is ready to hear arguments from respondents. May I please report? I'm pleased to be represented by Ms. Elizabeth Block and Mr. George Baldwin. Ms. Block will open with the first 15 minutes. Ms. Block, if we adopted a waiver by conduct exception as the Courts of Appeals have applied, wouldn't that completely undermine the legislative scheme? No, Judge, I don't believe it, it would. Well, um, I, I didn't say do away with it, but it would significantly undermine it, wouldn't it? Well, I, I apologize. That is certainly true. If, if, you, uh, if this court, and, and as Justice Owen, uh, I think, alluded to earlier, if this court does abolish sovereign immunity in its entirety, then yes, that would essentially do away with this particular statute. 
The deference to the legislature, though, I think would still be intact. The legislature would still have the opportunity to respond to any such decision by this court. That's what I don't understand. Why doesn't this statute apply to partially performed contracts? Why doesn't this statute apply to all contract disputes, period, and require you to go through that process? Because the statute does not say that it applies to all contract disputes. It says exclusive remedy. It states expressly in the contract, in the statute itself, that it is a prerequisite only to obtaining a legislative resolution to sue the state. That is the only prerequisite that's expressly stated in the statute. The arguments that we're presenting here today really have to be taken together. The first step I think this court has to address is whether or not there is any sort of waiver of immunity, either through performance or in its entirety when the state enters into a contract. Even if we say through partial performance there's a waiver of sovereign immunity, doesn't the statute come back behind that and say, even so, you have to go through the administrative process, and at the end of that you have to go to the legislature to get permission to sue? So whether we say you do or not seems to me sort of moot after the statute. I don't believe that this statute accomplishes that result. If this court does make a decision, either abolishing sovereign immunity in its entirety or through a waiver by conduct exception, the legislature can then take the opportunity, acting on a clean slate, to come in and enact, for example, an ADR procedure. Show me the provision in the statute where it says you don't have to go through this procedure if we were to abolish sovereign immunity based on partial performance. Well, of course it doesn't expressly say that because when this statute was enacted, sovereign immunity, as it was stated by this court in federal sign, was the law of the state. But it still says you have to go through the administrative process, right? I'll read you specifically from the statute. In section 2260.005 it says the procedures contained in this chapter are exclusive and required prerequisites to suit in accordance with chapter 107 of the Civil Practice and Remedies Code. So the legislature expressly told us what this was a prerequisite to, and it limited it, these procedures, to a prerequisite only when you have to go to the legislature to obtain a resolution to get the consent to sue. So one distinction that could be drawn there then would be that you have to go through this procedure if you want to sue on a contract which has not yet been performed. But if we draw the line saying that you don't have to go through this process for a contract that's been performed, that would be a distinction between when you would pursue the statutory remedy and when you would not have to pursue the statutory remedy. That is correct, Judge, and I think the plaintiff in a federal sign kind of case, if this case affirms the lower court's decision on a waiver by conduct exception, the plaintiff in a federal sign kind of case would still have to comply with the administrative procedures. In any of these states on your map, have they adopted a waiver by conduct exception? I have to confess it's not my map, it's Mr. Baldwin's map, and he can explain it a lot more than I can. I don't believe that's true, though. I don't believe that any other state has accepted a waiver by conduct exception of the similar nature to what the courts of appeals have done here. But I would point out two things. First of all, I believe Texas is the only state where we have the dichotomy between immunity from suit and immunity from liability. So that might explain the difference. I would also suggest that waiver by conduct is not a new concept to the jurisprudence of this state. It would be different from what the other states have adopted, but it is not a new concept. For example, we have a judicially created rule in Texas that when the state files a lawsuit, becomes a suitor in its own court by filing its own lawsuit, it has waived immunity from suit. That is a judicially created exception to sovereign immunity through conduct. The conduct there is the voluntary act of filing a lawsuit. Similarly, we have the judicially created exception that when the state enters into a contract, it waives its immunity from liability. Again, a judicially created exception based on conduct. So the concept of waiver by conduct is not a new one. Let me understand now. Suppose there were no sovereign immunity in these circumstances, no judicial doctrine of sovereign immunity in these circumstances in these three cases. Where does that leave the respondents vis-a-vis the statute, the administrative procedure, going to the legislature and so on? I think that, and again, as I pointed out, this statute was enacted at a time when sovereign immunity did exist under federal signs. So I think it is so cumbersome that the legislature would have to 
revisit the issue if this court does away with sovereign immunity in its entirety in the breach of contract context or creates a waiver by a conduct exception. Ms. Block, weren't the Houston and San Antonio cases both decided before the 99 legislative session? They were, and I think that's significant, Judge, because the legislature is presumed to know the state of the common law. And Araserv and Obiashi had both been decided at that time. Well, but the state's argument in response to that is, well, sure, they knew about it, and that's why they said you have to use this process. If they intended to overrule Araserv and Obiashi, and in fact, the court in Araserv expressly invited the legislature to overturn its decision and to prohibit suits if it disagreed with that decision, and the legislature did not do that. If even this court has difficulty getting the legislature to issue, why would they look at a CA opinion for any reason? Well, and Judge, my point is simply that that law was out there, and I do believe that it was the impetus for the legislature to address this issue. I'm not clear on your answer. Why are you saying that in passing this statute, the legislature did not, in essence, overturn those decisions? Well, if you look at the statement that is contained in the legislative history that the state relies on, it's a statement by Representative Greenberg on the House floor, and in that, she states that consent from the legislature is still mandatory before bringing a contract suit against the state, even if the contractor has performed. What I suggest to you is that that is, in fact, an incorrect statement of the law, because Araserv and Obiashi had been decided. Those cases determined that consent was not necessary. But they're CA cases. Under our law, they don't establish the common law. It's only decisions from this court that bind the legislature. So why should this court be so presumptuous as we've asked the legislature to act, they've acted, and we come back behind them and say, well, we don't think it's good enough. We're going to abolish sovereign immunity and let all these cases walk around the procedure that you've established, and you go back to the drawing board and start over. Why should this court take that task on? I think this court should have the courage to do so simply because the legislature has not provided either a reasonable or a workable or a responsible procedure for addressing these claims. Isn't that really the guts of your argument, that you don't like what the legislature has done and you think it's unreasonable and you're asking this court to act when you think the legislative response is inadequate? That's the guts of one part of my argument, Your Honor. But the guts of my other part really has to do with a very simple statutory construction, and that is look at what the legislature did, not what Representative Greenberg's statements were on the House floor. Let me ask you a question on that and see if I understand your argument. There are a number of claims that could be made against the state that don't necessarily arise out of contracts for which sovereign immunity would not be waived. Correct. And that includes torts, if they're not covered by the Tort Claims Act, in which event if it's some sort of tort not covered by the Tort Claims Act, the legislature could waive its sovereign immunity and give permission to sue, couldn't it? Yes. So this statute would have application in any circumstance involving where the sovereign immunity has not been waived or not? Well, I think the statute is limited to contract claims. Just contracts. But it's further limited to contract claims where legislative permission through a resolution from the legislature is a prerequisite to sue. And let me suggest that the state's construction of the statute, the construction that they're asking this court to adopt, is nonsensical when you consider other situations where the state through its conduct has already waived immunity from suit, such as when the state files a lawsuit. It cannot be, it cannot be that when the state files a lawsuit, the defendant in that case cannot simply file a counterclaim, which has been the law in the state for some time, but rather must go back to the administrative procedures, follow those procedures before it can assert the counterclaim. That cannot be the construction of the statute. You say it cannot be, but the legislature establishes the jurisdiction of all the courts in the state, doesn't it? The legislature expressly told us. And they can pick and choose who gets to sue where and who gets to bring what counterclaims where. Absolutely, absolutely. And they could have done that in this case, but they did not. What they told us was that this was a prerequisite to suits where legislative, a legislative resolution granting consent to sue under Chapter 107 of the Civil Practice Act. Why weren't they entitled to rely on this court's decision in federal sign that we were not going to abolish sovereign immunity with respect to contracts if they acted? And they did act. Now, why shouldn't we leave that alone? Why should this court come back and say, well, what you did is unreasonable? Well, Your Honor, what they did was unreasonable. And 
I'm, I'm running out of time. I do want to leave time for Mr. Baldwin, but let me point out that this statute really is nothing more than a procedure, and I suggest to you a very expensive and cumbersome procedure, for obtaining, for the legislature to obtain what is essentially an advisory opinion from an administrative law judge on whether or not funds should be appropriated and whether or not consent to sue should be granted. It does not adjudicate any claims. It does not resolve any claims. Even for claims under $250,000, if the claimant is not satisfied with that award, for example, if the claimant was seeking more than $250,000 but the ALJ determined that only $250,000 was, was, uh, was valid, the claimant is not even bound by that award, nor is the state because funds still might have to be appropriated to pay that. So it, the statute does not provide any real workable remedy, and it leaves you in, in a situation where you were, you were to start with, and that is the possibility of seeking legislative consent to sue, potentially doubly exposing the state to the costs, which I think uh, the legislature was attempting to avoid in enacting what is essentially an ADR procedure. And I, unless there are any further questions. Well, think? I'm concerned about that what the legislature did was unfair is what your argument is and then you express the reasons why but the legislature is the policy making body of our state government isn't it and yes, isn't sure. that the kind of decisions they make when they exercise that constitutional responsibility and authority it may not be fair, but it's within, a, it's within their discretion to make that policy decision, isn't it? It, it is, and it is, but it is also, I think, this court's responsibility to review the actions that the legislature has taken in this but area. But we don't have a constitutional attack on that process, and we don't just go out and say, well, we think it's unfair, too, even if we do, and decide, uh, well, we're, we're going to agree with you, it's unfair, so we're going to throw it out. Well, Judge, what definitely... is the constitutional basis, if any? even though it hadn't been alleged, to say believe, this is unfair and it, it, it's gone. Yeah, it I don't just, believe there's a, there's a constitutional basis, but, but I would simply point out that, that uh, sovereign immunity is a judicially created doctrine. It well, is subject to judicial Well, can we disagree with that? The um, doctrine of sovereign immunity existed before Texas was a state. Do you agree with that? Yes and the Constitution adopted common law that existed before we became a state. The state. And so therefore, it's a constitutionally approved doctrine that this court has followed, as it must. Well, uh, by implication, I suppose you could make that argument, but the legislature well, it's has never... Been, it's been made and said in cases. The legislature has, however, never adopted that either as part of the Constitution or as part of its uh, any legislative en enactments. There is no legislation. Well, would you agree on the other side, they have not only implicitly but expressly recognized its existence, such as saying we're going to waive it in tort cases or we're going to... Well, what, what about in 2260.006 when the legislature says this chapter does not waive sovereign immunity to suit or liability? Isn't that a recognition of the doctrine? Certainly. I, I, and again, at the time this statute was enacted, sovereign immunity did exist. There's no question about that. Um, th this is simply saying that this statute is not where you look to determine whether or not sovereign immunity is waived either for suit or for liability. And that's precisely my point. In our situation, if you have judicial determinations of a situation where sovereign immunity from suit has already been waived so that legislative resolution of, of consent to sue is not necessary, then you need not follow the procedures in this statute. Well, isn't a corollary to that assume that the legislature said, we don't care if when a state agency sues uh, about a waiver, we're going to hold that they don't waive their sovereign immunity so you can't file a cross-claim. Fair or not, they can say that. Would you agree? They, they could, but they have not done that. They have not done that. But and they have said something here, as Judge Gonzalez points out, that it doesn't waive immunity from it, it, And I agree with that. This doesn't address it. This statute is not where you look to determine whether or not. Well, why did it say that every claim that was pending or would happen after August of 1999 is covered by the statute? Wasn't your claim pending at that time? Yes, it was, Judge, and, and, and so that the, is another. I'm sorry? So really the only way to sustain your argument 
is uh, if this court says, well, that doctrine that's fashioned by the Austin Court of Appeals and the other two cases uh, is not a viable one and it's not going to be recognized by this court. Well, there, there, there are two ways to get there. One is to read the, the actual language that the legislature used in enacting the statute. No, no, I mean, without regard to the statute, that this court just says we're not buying into the Austin Court's view that there is waiver by conduct and that's not a viable uh, theory and it's, we reverse them. Then, then, the then we're back applies. to the statute, yes. Okay, thank you. It is, it is correct that there's only discussion about 2260 in the Little Tex case, but is it true that the other two private parties agree that the 2260 is an issue uh, to, that needs to be considered by this court? Absolutely. And let me just leave with, with one final point. Uh, there is a concern about that, that's been expressed by many members of the court about deference to the legislature. And I would simply point out that deference is not absolute. Reviewing courts, for example, certainly give deference to trial court determinations uh, that, are, that are within their uh, discretion. But that discretion is not absolute, and courts must and should have the courage to act in this situation when the legislature has attempted to act but has enacted a statute that is unworkable, that doesn't address the issues uh, that, that, that are truly before this court. And, and we would ask the court to re-examine federal sign and uh, determine whether or not sovereign immunity ought to be abolished. Well, I think we're going to have to re-examine it one way or the other. <laughs> I suspect that it will be, uh, it will be relegated to not, not footnote status in this case. Uh, but we do, we do ask that the court's, uh, lower court decisions be affirmed. May it please the court. My part of this argument was designed to be much simpler. Rather than argue that waiver by conduct ought to be granted, ought to be adapted by this court as a method of uh, sustaining the decision of the Austin Court of Appeals, my part of this argument was to ask you to reconsider and to reverse federal sign. But, but if we do, where does that leave the, the respondents in this case? I believe that if you were to reverse uh, federal sign to sustain the Austin Court of Appeals, we'd be back in district court. Why don't you have to comply with the statute? Because I don't think the statute applies if we don't have to get legislative permission to sue. I think the portion of the statute that Ms. Block read clearly makes the statute a condition precedent to seeking permission to sue. But wouldn't that gut the statute? Why would anybody then ever proceed under the statute? I, I think there are two ahead. reasons that the statute might have vitality if this court were simply to sustain the Austin Court of Appeals, especially on the issue of waiver by conduct. One, of course, is in the federal sign instance where well, there's I, no performance. I, I, I didn't understand that to be your argument. I'm talking about under your argument to, to change our decision in federal sign. If we were to do that, we'd be wiping the statute off the books. I believe you would. I believe if you, if you were to reverse federal sign, and say that when the state enters into a contract, it waives its immunity from suit and its immunity from liability, then yes, the statute would have no vitality, except the statute is being incorporated into the contracts that folks are signing around this state. Well, and it would become no an, different than any other context. It would become an administrative on. procedure to, to address and possibly resolve claims. Okay. Mr. Baldwin, you, you said you were gonna make a simple argument. And your argument is to uh, overrule federal sign. Yes, sir. What more could I have said to have tried to convince my colleagues that there was not sovereign immunity in contract cases? Well, you're, you're. <laughs> <laughs> There's no way to answer that question. <laughs> your colleagues gave, gave great deference to the legislature in, in the majority and concurring opinion. I would argue that having given deference to the legislature and looking what the legislature did in 2260, what you're left with is a statute that basically has no vitality, no use, even if you were to overrule the Austin Court of Appeals. The statute is illusory. It doesn't provide a remedy. The argument that was brought when, when federal sign initially came up, the attacks on sovereign immunity over the last 10 years in the courts of this state, have focused on the absence of a remedy afforded disappointed contractors by the state of Texas. Well, let's get 
right to the chase here. Even if we were to abolish sovereign immunity and you got a judgment, don't you still have to go to the legislature and get We would still have to go to the legislature to, to get an appropriation. So you're That's in the correct. same boat, ultimately. Well, I don't believe we are in the same boat, ultimately. I believe we'd have a judgment of the district court, perhaps affirmed by a court of appeals and by this court, and the legislature wouldn't be in a position where it would need to evaluate my claim. It wouldn't be in a position where we send me back to try the case over again. I would have tried the case. But they would say we're not going to pay. Yeah. They could perhaps say it. They could. haven't said that in the past, and I don't know that we would. How about Mr. Green? He didn't get his entire. Mr. Green settled his case uh -huh. at one point or another. Mr. Green's well, judgment you, was far. You can't levy execution if the um, legislature says, no, we're not going to appropriate the money to pay your judgment, can you? Absolutely not. And, and that that establishes the. the well, so. Doesn't that cut against your argument that this process that's been set up in 2260 furnishes nothing? It's illusory? I, I don't believe it does. I, I don't believe it does because if you were to follow the, the procedure that's set out in 2260, you'd have to initially mediate or arbitrate, mediate or negotiate your claim. Fine. Everybody wants to do that. It's a good way of resolving a claim. You then got to go through basically an extensive fact-finding endeavor with an administrative law judge in which the state rules of civil procedure are, are involved, in which the state rules of evidence inv are involved, basically you'd need to try your case in front of an ALJ, who then would, would render a decision that really isn't binding on anybody. If the decision is less than $250,000 and the state somehow has money to pay it, and the state somehow chooses to pay it, perhaps you'll get paid. But if the litigant doesn't like that decision, or the state doesn't like that decision and chooses not to pay, or the award is over $250,000, you're left to go to the legislature. Which isn't any different than you've been for 150 years. Except under that particular procedure, what the legislature is likely to tell you to do is to go try your case in a district court. And then when you're finally finished trying a case in a district court, come back to the legislature again and try to get the, the judgment funded. You're looking at a process that could well take five, six, or seven years. That simply is not economically justified. It certainly isn't going to benefit the state in terms of saving it money in the process and could well bankrupt most contractors that have to go through it. If, in fact, you were to abrogate sovereign immunity and the district court had jurisdiction over breach of contract claims against the state, you'd try it once. Sure, you'd have to go to the legislature to get funding for your judgment if the case didn't settle. And as we all know, 95 to 98 percent of the cases that I'm involved with, construction contract cases, settle. You go to the legislature and say, I have a judgment, please fund it. What you would not get from the legislature is a direction to go relitigate the case. And I think that's far different. Mr. Baldwin, far different. how does um, 2260 compare to the laws enacted to give a right, of, a right to hearing in actions in those purple states on your map? The, um, what, what, the, what, the map, what the map doesn't show is, and, and I apologize for that, I, I thought of that this morning. What the map doesn't show is in those blue states where the legislature abrogated sovereign immunity, which of those states the legislature said go to court, and which of those states established an administrative procedure, a court of claims. Those, are those binding administrative in, in, procedures? Let me answer your question okay. in, in this way. In the roughly six to eight states that have courts of, courts of claims, which would mean that 18 of those legislatures said jurisdictions in the district court. In the six to eight courts that have courts of claims, um, it's my understanding they're binding. They're binding in Illinois, it's binding in Pennsylvania. Um, I believe it's binding in Wisconsin. Those are the ones that come instantly to mind. So in six, six to eight of those blue states, there, are, there is a binding administrative procedure, and in the remainder of the state, the legislature abrogated sovereign immunity and said go to court. And said go to says. court. That's correct. Now, the, a, a question did arise as to whether any of those red states adopted the, the, the idea of waiver by, by conduct. The answer to that question is yes and no. As, as Ms. Block said, only Texas, as far as I've been able to tell, has this sort of peculiar dichotomy between waiver by, con by waiver of uh, suit and, and immunity by suit and immunity from, from liability. Other states haven't had to deal with that. But what other states have said 
one of the four basic ways that states have abrogated sovereign immunity judicially is that through the conduct of entering into a contract, the state has waived its, its immunity because inherent in the nature of contract is mutuality of obligation and mutuality of remedy. Well, but we talked about that in federal sign and settled that argument well, I think against you, your viewpoint. I think you discussed the issue of mutuality yeah, of well, remedy. Yeah, that's what you just said, didn't you? It is. I said mutuality of obligation mm -hmm. and mutuality mm -hmm. of remedy. Mm -hmm. Interestingly enough, common law principles that existed at the time the Texas Constitution was adopted. Aren't you actually asking this court to engage in a tug of war or a tussle with the legislature? Because if we were to do what you suggest, which is to gut their statute, and they come back the session in January, and by legislative decree say they're sovereign immunity and we are reestablishing this same procedure, where are you then? If you were to do what I suggest, what I would, what I would posit would, would happen is this court would say there's a common law doctrine called sovereign immunity that we don't believe has any vitality at this point in time. The legislature would then be free to enact whatever kind of disputes resolution device it felt was equitable under those circumstances, or perhaps say sovereign immunity ought to be the law of the land. But the, the, the legislature would be acting on a blank slate. The legislature would be empowered at that point to establish some kind of remedy. It probably would. Well, would it, and what if they come back and do exactly what they've done in this statute? Then I think the statute would have to be analyzed in terms of whether it provides an appropriate remedy and is constitutionally sound. Why don't we wait till we get that case to decide whether we're going to abrogate the statute? Because I think the doctrine is yours to abrogate. And I think the statute that was enacted in 1999 doesn't provide a remedy that's effective or, or, or economic or, or fair for that matter. And the, the, the proof of that pudding is in the some years since that statute has been effective, nothing has occurred under that statute. There's been a case that was filed by my client that's been abated pending this lawsuit. But few other litigants have taken advantage of that particular administrative process. In one case in which a litigant tried to take advantage of that process, the state agency in question filed the lawsuit because it didn't want to go through the legislative process. So there's something inherently Well, but when they did that, they waived immunity from yes. suit. Mm -hmm. So why would that company want to go through the process? The if the state was, said the, the door's open, come on in. The company was overjoyed to be in, in district court. Let, what, let me ask you, like, in answer to Justice Owen's question, you said, well, we should just abrogate sovereign immunity. Uh, if we did that 100%, does it affect the Tort Claims Act or any other act where there's limited waivers and so forth? Does Just, it, Justice what Baker, happens? We're, we're only asking you to, to abrogate sovereign immunity in the instance where the state enters into a valid written contract. That's, that's the only set of circumstances under which we're asking you to abrogate the doctrine. Where the legislature has already authorized the state to enter into a contract, where the legislature has appropriated the money for the state to pay for the contract, where the legislature has clearly expressed the intent that the state pay for that contract, and where the legislature has clearly intended that the money go to the contracting party. I think that's the area where you should give deference to the legislature. Any other questions? Just very quickly, is there any research or law that supports your map that is not included in your briefing? I believe that um, there are, <laughs> my appendix includes case citations from 20 states. Um, I don't believe it includes a case, the cases from Maine or from Nebraska, which I'd be more than happy to supply to you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Council. Mr. Coleman, is there anything a contractor can do to prospectively protect themselves? Can they go to the legislature uh, before entering into a contract and get an appropriation? Or, or, or have money set aside in the bidding process? I just don't know how the process works. I haven't seen that done. I don't know whether they could. I, I would suspect not. But certainly, um, all pr prospectively, all contracts for good services and building construction will have provisions and do now have provisions that require that these SOA procedures be used. And, I, and I'd like to make one other point about that. That's subsection 004 of the statute. When they say that the legislature didn't intend this statute to apply to claims in which there could be an arguable waiver by conduct. I think that's completely inconsistent with 004. I think the statute by its own terms is meant to apply to all contracts for good services and building construction. 004 requires that it be included in all of these contracts so on a going forward basis 
you're not going to have a contract that doesn't say you have to go to SOA. So that really the only question is what about the contracts that were in existence before the effective date? The legislature said those have got to go. The, the exchange between Representative Farabee and Representative Greenberg wasn't just statements on the floor. I mean, I've, I've probably made you sick citing that so often in our briefs. It was adopted as a statement of legislative intent, and they said, no, you've got to go even if there has been arguably waiver by conduct. There's been some performance on the contract or other Well, let me conduct. ask you a question about that. In the Little Tex case, uh, they attached as an exhibit to their brief a copy of the proposed amendment, which they say failed, uh, which very clearly uh, says what your argument is. Uh, and your response in your brief was, well, you know, they said that, but there's no legislative history that they quote. Is there any legislative history that shows uh, why that was br brought before the House on the floor and uh, what resulted in its alleged failure? I didn't locate anything specifically, but I think it was eminently reasonable for them to not put that in the text of the statute. The statute was intended to set out the procedures. That sentence, which does appear in the legislative history by Representative Greenberg, is really about the same as what was in that amendment. And I think it was properly put in the legislature's statement of what they intended rather than in, in the statutory procedures themselves. So, so I think it was reasonable, but no, the answer to your question is no. I, I don't have anything specific on that. Let me go back to your earlier rebuttal argument. Uh, one argument made by the respondents was that uh, this statute can be given full vitality if it is applied uh, to a federal sign type situation but does not have to be applied to a situation where you have a fully performed contract. Did I understand you as saying that uh, uh, 004 is the answer to that? I think 004 is part of the answer to that in, on a go going forward basis, yes. But I also think that your question is a great big softball for me because, <laughs> because <laughs> what, I'm going to try. What that invites is that going, if, if the court says that about that's what this statute means, every complaint will be a lawsuit, as you recognize, Justice Noble. Every one will be a lawsuit, we'll have an allegation, and we will have to litigate, or you, the courts, will have to litigate whether that case presented sufficient facts of waiver by conduct. If it does, it goes forward. If it doesn't, then you go back to SOA. That's not what the legislature wanted to do. Well, would you would you go back to uh, 004? Because I'm I'm not certain which language you're pointing to in uh, 004. You're saying answers that question. Uh, 004 says, after the effective date of this of this chapter, you've got to include in every contract for goods, services, building, construction a provision that requires the dispute resolution process under this chapter. So. Those contracts have to say, if we have a dispute, we, we've got to use Chapter 2260. So contracts that have been entered after uh, 31 August of last year hopefully include that provision, and they, they will have to use that. Whether there's conduct that might witness a, a waiver or not. Mr. Coleman, does, can a state agency contract without the authority of the legislature? without a statutory authority to enter into a contract? Could a state agency enter into any sort of contract to buy services or products? Is there some sort of inherent power to do so? No, I, I guess think not. not. So the legislature actually has to give authority to an, an agent to contract on the government's behalf. That's correct, Your Honor. So what sense does it make that uh, anyone that what sense does it make to say that by giving that authority, that's not some sort of clear statement that that party, the state ought to be bound by that contract? I mean, what is, what's the rationale for the state having to authorize someone to enter into a contract if, in fact, the, the other party of the contract has no agreement unless they go back to the legislature to get permission by the legislature to then litigate over whether 
they had this agreement that they're bound by. And before you answer that, can I just put a twist on the question? Because <laughs> I think before I'm asking that. the same thing. <laughs> Go ahead. Uh, same question, and I think you can phrase it this way. What rational basis is there for drawing a distinction between immunity from suit and immunity from liability, since we seem to be the only state doing that in light of Justice Enoch's question? Justice Enoch, I know you disagreed with that part, but it was part of the holding a federal sign that when you enter it into a contract, you are in fact bound and the law of contracts does apply to you. Sovereign immunity really is a remedial doctrine. You simply can't sue, but the law as it exists does apply to you. And so in that sense, you are bound and you do have a remedy. It's simply that the legislature has said, you know, before, uh, we allow people to start executing on our state office buildings, we want a chance to determine whether, in fact, we're going to appropriate monies to pay those judgments. But that happens whether you have sovereign immunity or not. The court doesn't need to protect the state. The state has to appropriate it or not. The, clearly, you get a judgment without an appropriation. Green is an example. Uh, there's no collection there. So That's part mean, of the immunity, though. So, but it doesn't require the court to sit there and say, you've got to get permission to sue. No, it doesn't. But it has historically been the law in Texas. This court has always said, look to the legislature. The legislature has acted, and it has chosen to, and I, and I disagree with counsel. I don't think it's a slower process. I think it is a faster and more efficient process to go through the administrative contested case adjudication and the vast, vast majority of those claims will be resolved in that setting so that the number of requests for consent to sue that the legislature sees will be far fewer than they have been in the past and they will have hopefully the opportunity to look at them a little more closely and make a reasoned and rational decision about which ones to grant if the procedures of 2260 are ultimately unsuccessful. But we hope that in most or all cases, that those procedures will be successful to the satisfaction of both the state and those who contract with the state. And that is our ultimate hope for this procedure. Any other questions? Well, thank you, counsel. That concludes the argument. In the second set of causes, we'll take another brief recess. ready to hear argument from petitioner in St. Joseph Hospital versus Wolf. May it please the court, we appreciate the opportunity to present arguments to the court today in this case. St. Joseph Hospital in Houston appeals an $8 million judgment holding it vicariously liable for a physician's failure to make a proper diagnosis in treating a patient, Stacey Wolf, in a different hospital in a different city. This case raises several issues. Principally today, I will discuss briefly the failure to submit the settling parties and then the joint enterprise doctrine, although I would be glad to discuss with the court any of the issues that have been raised in this case. Before we get into joint enterprise, the respondent seemed to spend a considerable part of its brief talking about the employee status of this resident. And I take it you concede he was your employee or the hospital's employee, St. Joseph's employee. No, Your Honor, we do not. We concede, and it's not the word concede may not be appropriate, but we believe that he was at the time an employee of Central Texas Medical Foundation, a physician service organization that is authorized by Texas statute to employ physicians and to practice medicine. But you're saying he's a borrowed employee. The Court of Appeals didn't decide the case on employment status. We certainly believe that if employment status became the reason for the decision, then we would need to have a borrowed servant submission submitted to the jury in this particular case. But why shouldn't you be liable? I mean, you paid his salary. You gave him W-2s. You, on the federal income tax, 
filings he was shown as your employee. Why shouldn't you simply be vicariously liable for your own employee's negligence? Well, one thing that you've already alluded to is the barred servant issue. At the time of this event, of course, the event that gave rise to this litigation, Dr. Villafani was working under the supervision of an attending physician who was working for Central Texas Medical Foundation and was thus not under the direct supervision of anyone with St. Joseph Hospital. Let me ask you about that. This deals with the employee. He was, this doctor was a student of St. Joseph's. He was a student in an integrated residency program. And St. Joseph was going to, St. Joseph was going to do whatever St. Joseph did to certify that this individual could go out and represent themselves to the public as being a licensed medical doctor. Right? Well, the license, of course, doesn't come from St. Joseph Hospital. Dr. Villafani was licensed in 1991 as a medical doctor and was authorized to practice law, practice medicine, rather, in this state. And that was the law. So what is St. Joseph's doing with this program? St. Joseph is sponsoring a program of medical education that is a postgraduate course of study in a particular specialty, namely the surgical specialty. Which requires clinical activity, hands-on activity, in order to accomplish St. Joseph's educational program. The educational program certainly included patient care as part of the overall program. So how does St. Joseph say, we're not responsible for our students' negligence? Well, there are several reasons. One reason, at the time that Dr. Villafani was administering care to Stacey Wolfe. Under St. Joseph's program. He was doing so. Well, part of the issue in this case, Judge, Justice Enoch, very frankly, is how do we define the enterprise in this case? And the enterprise has... I'm not trying to define the enterprise. I'm trying to... St. Joseph had a program that this doctor was a student in that, as a part of that program, required clinical activities. And the question is, how is the school sponsoring that program not responsible for the student's negligence in performing that activity? Because at the time of the medical care that was rendered to Stacey Wolfe, one reason is that at that time, Dr. Villafani was working under the direct supervision of an attending physician under Central Texas Medical Foundation. So he was employed at that time by a different employer, not St. Joseph Hospital. That is a matter of... Because you've got a jury finding against you on that very question. That's correct. So that's as a matter of law, you're saying? We're arguing as a matter of law for a couple of reasons that there is a total absence of any control over the event that produced the injury that gave rise to the litigation in this case. But isn't the issue the right of control and not the exercise of control? Actually, I think it is. And there is really no dispute in this case and no claim in this case that St. Joseph Hospital somehow came to Brackenridge Hospital and supervised the care that took place May 12th, late in the night, and May 13th, early in the morning. I didn't get your answer to my predicate question. Is the issue the right of control or the exercise of control? I don't think there's any claim here that there's an exercise of control by St. Joseph, so it all turns on right of control. And clearly, St. Joseph had the right of control under the agreement. No, St. Joseph Hospital had the right of control over the program of medical education. And one of the things that you see that's missing... Well, it may control the details of the medical tasks performed by the resident when they are assigned. The contract between CTMF and Brackenridge is the only contracted issue that deals with patient care at Brackenridge Hospital in Austin, Texas. And what it says is that St. Joseph Hospital shall not control in paragraph G. It's shown on page 3 of the exhibits to our oral argument. On paragraph G, it says, St. Joseph Hospital shall not control the medical details of the work done by the physicians at the time that they are in Brackenridge Hospital, save and accept through consultation and mutual consent of the two parties. And when you have to ask somebody's permission and get consent in order to consult with a patient at a different hospital, that's not a right of control. It gives you an opportunity to ask for consultation and participation in the patient care, but it's not a right of control. But didn't the hospital have control over the general guiding parameters of what the student physicians were to do? Yes, it had control over the medical education program and parameters. And the medical education program included providing patient care. In fact, it was essential to the medical education program that's at issue here. 
And that's why St. Joseph's had the agreement in the first place, because it was unable to provide that kind of patient care at its own hospital. And its own hospital didn't have the depth of trauma uh, experience uh, that was felt to be necessary uh, for this surgical specialty. Uh, that is correct. And is uh, it also correct that patient care was an essential part of this particular medical training program? Patient care was an essential part of the program, but the patient care that we're talking about in this particular case, the care of Stacy Lynn Wolf, took place in a different hospital with persons supervising and controlling the events uh, that were separate and apart from Jan St. Joseph. And but St. Joseph's also had a right via its contract to influence who it would be that was um, uh, supervising the work of the residents while they were at Brackenridge. It had correct? the right. It had the right to determine or to approve or disapprove whoever was selected as the faculty members of Central Texas Medical Foundation to provide uh, supervision. But there's and no. So that's some right of control, isn't it? That's some right of control, but it's a right of control over the educational program. And there's no complaint in this case that the educational program itself was deficient, that there wasn't supervisors. Well, but you keep separating the educational program from patient care, and I'm not sure how you can do that since patient care is, is an essential part and probably one of the most essential part of a residency program. How do you separate the two? You're, you're putting medical education over here in a different ballpark when, in fact, this is a clinical education program where patient care is essential. Otherwise, you don't have a, pro a residency program. So how can you separate the two? Well, one reason for the separation, really you look, have to look at the control that was exercised that gave rise to the event, the injury-producing event. And I think that follows this court's uh, cases, uh, starting with Williams versus Olivo, well, Coastal Service Marine versus Lawrence, Kirk Selenese versus Mendez. All of those cases this court was focusing on after a long progression from Redinger, which seemed to have control very broadly defined, focusing in on control over the particular events that enabled the lawsuit to be brought that caused the injury. Well, aren't you asking us to draw a line then at teaching hospitals who are providing residents who do not have the one, two, or three years of postgraduate training that, in fact, most physicians get? They are made available to uh, provide medical care to patients. And now you're asking us to draw a line and say that when a patient comes into a teaching hospital, oops, we're not responsible, even though we're the ones who put those <coughs> new doctors who are still learning in that position. Again, again, I see you drawing a line between medical training and patient care when the patient care is essential to the medical training program. Yes, we are asking the court to draw a line. In fact, the line, uh, to some extent, has already been drawn uh, by the legislature and by, by judicial decisions interpreting uh, the Licensure Act, which says that only persons who are licensed to practice medicine are the ones who can practice medicine. And we have a long history in this state of a prohibition against the practice of medicine by corporations. I want to ask you about that because I'm not clear about this. In the respondent's brief, um, they cite a lot of cases that say a resident is different from a physician who's uh, fully accredited and on staff. And my specific question is, let's suppose that this resident all of this had happened at, at St. Joseph Hospital while he was under the supervision of a group of doctors. Would St. Joseph's be liable for uh, this resident's negligence? Corporations can't practice medicine. Uh, the supervising doctors who supervise Dr. Villafani at a different hospital would be liable if they participated in the patient care and they made errors of medical but isn't judgment. But isn't that different than, I mean, most doctors are independent contractors vis-a-vis -vis a hospital. Here you have a direct finding of an employee employer relationship similar to, say, nurses. And what, what, where would you draw the distinction there? Well, the distinction, I think, is drawn in, in the statute. And here we have sort of a synthesis between the legislative uh, and the judicial decisions in this area that there is a corporate ban on, there's a ban on the corporate practice of medicine. Uh, we don't want corporations like hospitals controlling the practice of medicine, and we're going to allow medical doctors to make those decisions. But the distinction so she pointed out which also goes towards the purpose of that legislation when they don't, the legislature didn't want corporations or companies practicing medicine, but that's not the issue. The issue is not who practices medicine. It's whether or not the hospital can be held liable for one of their employees. But if the hospital is held liable for the employee, uh, as one of the amicus briefs very eloquently pointed out by Texas Children's Medical Center or Children's Medical Center and Baylor University and Texas Hospital Association, 
if you impose liability in that situation, where in this situation, San Joseph Hospital was not trying to interfere with this medical treatment of Stacey Wolf. If you impose liability, then you are giving, conferring, a right to control the physician's conduct in the other hospital, and that is contrary but to the statute. But didn't we cross this bridge in Baptist Hospital versus Samson not very long ago? And no. That statute is not an absolute bar to a non-doctor entity being held liable for a doctor's conduct. Chief Justice Phillips, I think the issue there was very different because you're dealing with ostensible agency. The result well, of whatever. I mean, it's still the it, the hospital was being held liable for what their doctor did, and the, these same arguments were made. I mean, precisely the most of the oral argument time was spent statute, 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 just like we're hearing today, and uh, we explained that. The explanation, I believe is in the type of control or activity we're talking about by the hospital. In an ostensible agency case, the inquiry is whether the hospital has misled or has affirmatively uh, given people the impression that the doctors are the employees of the hospital. And the hospital well, obviously the, can the, control. The doctor is an employee, so well, pass that. The hospital obviously can decide to put up signs saying these are independent contractors. Uh, if it chooses to do so and avoid the ostensible agency. But imposing ostensible agency doesn't require that the hospital control the doctor. All it does is say that the hospital needs to post signs or take whatever action it feels is necessary to avoid uh, the confusion of the doctor with the hospital. So I think the uh, Samson case is, is different and the ostensible agency Sh surely, is a different concept. Surely in Texas we crossed this bridge. Are residents employees of hospitals for vicarious liability purposes or not? I guess I have two questions. Have we, is there law in that in Texas? And two, what's the law outside of Texas? Most states have the same statute we have, don't they, about corporations can't practice medicine. So how have they handled the, the vicarious liability for residents issue? Uh, this issue, of course, has not been addressed by this court before. Uh, the uh, other states uh, take different approaches. Not all states have a ban on corporate practice of medicine. Some do have a statutory ban, some have a common law ban, some of the statutory bans exempt hospitals, for instance. Uh, so it's not a very consistent body of case law. There are certainly cases that have discussed, for instance, the Brigger case they cite that discuss residents. That particular state doesn't even have a ban on corporate practice of medicine. Uh, so there's no case in this state uh, that holds one way or the other on residents. I don't believe that the Young case, which has been cited by the other side really makes a holding on that because I think it's really more of an ostensible agency case and is in any event in a plea of privilege context. Well, Mr. Let's Simpson, assume Ed, do you disagree with the foot, I can't recall the specific footnote, but a footnote in your opponent's brief that cites a long list of decisions from other states which go against you on this issue? There are a number of decisions in other states with yes or varying no, do you agree facts. With, do you agree I, I, with the representation? I do not agree that. that I'm sorry, I do not agree that as an overall proposition there is a consistent body of law in the other states that holds hospitals liable for the conduct of residents. Are there cases in other states that allow hospitals to not be vicariously liable for residents who are employees of the hospital? For residents per se, um, are there any cases that go your way under the, that particular fact situation, other jurisdictions? I think that the Rodriguez versus City of City and County of Denver deals with a resident. Is that That's a, a case that we cited in our reply brief, uh, and I will check to see if that, in fact, dealt Is that with a Colorado, a Colorado case, Colorado, Colorado case. Supreme Court? I don't believe it's Colorado Supreme Court. Any, any other jurisdictions, then, that, in fact, the high, high, highest civil court in that particular state agrees with your position? I don't think there's any high court's decision in another state that specifically addresses the facts of this case in a resident. Let, let okay, me let make me, sure I'm not. I'm sorry. Excuse me. Go ahead. Well, isn't a logical extension of your of your argument then when you say that because of the licensing statute, the hospital cannot control the details of the um, of the work of the resident, the medical judgment being exercised? Then how would you distinguish that situation? from when a nurse is alleged to have committed negligence and the hospital is, um, there's a claim that the hospital is vicariously liable because the nurse has to exercise medical judgment too and is also licensed by the state to do that. So how then are we going to draw the line between nurses and also laboratory technicians and residents? 
there's a long-standing body of law in this state and other states dealing with the physician, the doctor-patient relationship and holding that corporations should not invade that particular uh, relationship. So the doctor-patient relationship is different from uh, the nurse-patient So you patient are not advocating that hospitals should not be vicariously liable for the alleged, for the negligence of nurses, laboratory technicians, or other hospital employees who are exercising some form of medical judgment. You're we are not advocating that, no. Let me make sure, this is a pretty comprehensive jury verdict, as I'm sure you know better than me. Yes. Uh, but let me see if I'm missing something. If there is some evidence that uh, Dr. Villafani was an employee of St. Joseph's Hospital, and if hospitals can be liable for the conduct of their residents, isn't that the end of the case? And we don't have to go into all this joint and several liability and whether or not that's the end of ever hiring an independent con I mean, all the joint adventures, joint enterprises, whether or not you can ever hire an independent contractor to build your building again if we hold the way the respondents want us to here. Well, our two position steps. is if, there, if there's some evidence he's an employee. Okay, going back to the employee issue, Chief Justice Phillips, right. as opposed to the joint enterprise issue. That's right. Forget joint enterprise. If there's some evidence he's an employee and if hospitals can be responsible for the medical decisions of their residents. It's our position that there is no evidence of any right of control that we give employee status uh, that right, the I statutory realize that, prohibition prohibits that. Uh, if that is the focus of the court's decision, then it needs to go back for a new trial on the barred servant uh, issue because we did not get a barred servant issue at the trial of this case. That was one of the charge errors that was made uh, along with not submitting the two settling parties, the, the uh, automobile drivers, uh, those require a remand for a new trial. Uh, we did not get a barred servant employee uh, issue, oh. and if it goes off in employment, we need yeah. that issue. And was that preserved in the Court of Appeals? As yes, well? it was. I wanted to ask you a question. You alluded to uh, the uh, error in not submitting the, the other people. Do I recall that you said that if if that's error, that it's automatic reversible error? That there's no harm analysis? Yes, if there's no harm analysis, it's fundamental, as this court held in the Castile case, uh, for a litigant to be judged by a jury properly instructed in the law. In this situation, we will never know what the jury would have answered as far as the proportionate responsibility questions and cannot. But what about the instruction the that limited any damages to um, caused solely by Dr. The doctor's negligence, not somebody else's. The statutory scheme set up by the legislature on the submission of seven parties doesn't disappear or doesn't provide an avenue of redefining damages for purposes of avoiding the submission of a seven well, party. I'm a little concerned whether every failure to submit a requested question is automatic reversible error when our rules, the appellate rules say, so be that, but you have to show that that failure did lead to an improper judgment. And there seems to me some concern that by the limiting instruction, how can you show that an improper judgment was entered? Well, on the limiting instruction, uh, the uh, drivers of the automobiles are just as responsible for any damages caused by medical negligence later on in the treatment of Stacey Wolf as anyone else under Texas law, Cannon versus Pearson decision by this, this court. So you cannot really separate uh, the damages uh, that were presented to the jury and the conduct of the drivers. Well, let me ask you a question. If the jury came back and said that the drivers were 90% liable and the doctors were 10% liable, and then answered a question as what damages were approximately caused by the doctor's malpractice, wouldn't the doctors be liable for 100% of those damages? regardless of how they decided the apportionment of responsibility. Well, I think the statutory scheme set up by the legislature says that the apportionment takes place in the proportionate responsibility question that asks the percentage of responsibility of each of the defendants that the assumes, settling parties. But that assumes the defendants, that, that both defendants are jointly and uh, severally liable for all the damages, but the doctors are not liable for the car accident damages. So you would have, if you included all of them, you would still have to ask the jury to apportion damages for the part that the doctors and the drivers are jointly liable for, 
and separate those from the damages that only the drivers are liable for. And so even if you got to a joint responsibility and the doctors, as you say, gosh, they could have been found less than 10% liable, they would still be liable for 100% of the damages found by the jury in this case. The drivers in the automobile accident would also have joint and several liability for any damages that the doctors caused under the law of the state. And therefore, well, they might be liable for it, but the doctors would still be liable for 100% of the damages found in this case. I mean, there's nothing about submitting the proportionate liability or anything that would have produced a different judgment as to the doctors in this case. I think if the proportionate liability question had been submitted and the doctors were 10% or less liable, then they would have paid only for 10% of the total amount of damages that were caused by the entire events that gave rise to the lawsuit. Maybe I'm not being clear. In this case, the jury only found damages that were caused by the doctor's negligence, meaning the medical malpractice. Are you saying that had the drivers been found 90% responsible for a total amount of damages, that the doctors would not be responsible for the damages for the malpractice or for 90% of the damages by the malpractice? Well, what I'm saying is that redefining the damages, which is something that's not authorized by the proportionate responsibility statute, doesn't change anything. What you have to do is follow the statute. You submit the entire damages caused by the events in question, and you have a proportionate responsibility decision that then apportions the damages among the various people. And the drivers have joint and several responsibility for the doctor's malpractice. Was there a request in this case that the negligence of the drivers be determined? Was that tried in this case? It was not tried in this case, but there was a request for their conduct to be submitted. Well, in the proportionate response, but was there a request that a determination be made as to whether or not they were negligent and whether or not their conduct was the proximate cause of the injury in question? I believe that there was, Judge. I'll have to check that. Let's follow up on what you just said. You said it wasn't tried, but you made a request for the question. If it wasn't tried, what evidence is there to support the request? There is evidence concerning the negligence of the drivers. If you look at Volume 1, about pages 240, there's evidence of negligence of John Thomas, who was the driver. There's also evidence. We did have that question that came up as far as other medical providers and whether there was negligence against them, and there was not. But as far as the drivers, I don't think there's any contention that there's an absence of negligence. Let me ask you a different question going back to your earlier discussion, and that is if we adopt your position that the hospital should not be held liable for the negligence of its resident, when a resident does commit negligence that causes injury, who are the potential parties who would be subject to liability? The potential parties, of course, would be the resident, attending physicians who had a doctor-patient relationship with a particular injured party, a nurse, such as Nurse Suzanne Harris in this case. And the hospital in most situations, as a practical matter, Judge, is also going to be a defendant in the case. There will be claims of direct negligence in many cases against the hospital for improper procedures, perhaps, or not following procedures. The hospital is vicariously liable for the conduct of the nurse and other technicians who are not physicians. So there certainly is a remedy here. Isn't it the hospital's insurance that is behind the resident while he's practicing? As part of the residency program, the hospital did purchase a policy of insurance that afforded coverage to Dr. Villafane. Going back to the jury charge question, following up on what Judge Baker was talking about, you are, if I understood you correctly, you're basically saying that the failure to submit the driver's proportionate responsibility in this case amounts to error requiring reversal without a showing of probable harm. That's correct because we'll never know what the jury would have decided. We can't tell what the jury would have decided. So we're going back to the error before we started imposing harmful errors or requirements so that charge error now automatically requires reversal. Not all charge error, perhaps, but this charge error because we... Why should this case be one that we do not apply the reversible error rule? Well, it's similar to the Castile case in a way. You don't know whether the jury made its decision in Castile on the basis of the invalid cause of action. Here you don't know what the jury's percentages would have been, and if the percentages on the doctors would have been 10 percent or less, then there would not be joint and several liability for the entire amount of the damages caused. If we were to require a showing of probable harm, is that shown in this case given the wording of the questions that were given to the jury? Because the charge looks like this case was tried, as Chief Justice Phillips said, it's an extensive charge. It was tried as a medical malpractice case. 
It was not tried as a car crash case. Can you show probable harm in that the drivers could have been found responsible for a significant enough percentage to have affected the outcome, given the fact that the case was tried and the charge was limited in a way that only the malpractice claim was tried and the damages were limited to it? Can you meet a probable harm showing? I think because there's no way you can tell what the jury would have come up with. No, sir. I'm assuming that rule doesn't apply. And we're going to the language of the rule that says probable harm. Has probable harm been shown in this case? And if so, how? When you have admitted in your brief that the odds of showing the drivers were responsible to a percentage that would have affected the result is unlikely, as I recall your words. How are you going to find probable harm? Well, first of all, we don't agree with the way that the damages were limited and the entire submission was made. If it's proper to limit the damages the way this was done and to avoid the applicability of Chapter 33 of the Proportionate Responsibility Statute, the Civil Practice Remedies Code, then if you define the universe as only those damages involving medical malpractice, then I still say that the original tortfeasors, the drivers of the cars, of the vehicles, are jointly responsible for any damages that are caused, and therefore the jury can still say that most of this all caused or resulted from the conduct of the drivers. There's also plenty of evidence. But why wasn't it remedied by the settlement credit that was given to the drivers? Because the statute requires that you have a submission of proportionate responsibility. There's also evidence in this case that most of the brain damage was done at the time of the original collision and not by the medical malpractice. And that was your argument to the jury? That was the jury argument. Based on the charge that says only assess an amount that was a result of malpractice, not as a result of the accident. So you argued that to the jury, and the jury had the opportunity to consider that very point. That's correct. Based on the charge that was submitted to them. And you're assuming then that the jury did not follow the instructions and assess some damages that were caused by the accident as opposed to the malpractice. And because you're worried about that, the way the case is, that's where you argue you can't now prove that you were harmed because you don't know what the jury really considered when it decided that question. Well, I think that because we don't know what the jury would have decided on a proper submission of this case under Chapter 33 of the Civil Practice Remedies Code, we'll never know what the correct answer would have been or what the answer should have been under the statutory scheme established by the legislature. And because we cannot know, then we need to have a new trial. But you elected a dollar-for-dollar credit. Yes. Not a percentage. That's correct. Okay. So, again, back to my question, what difference would it make? It would only then affect joint several liability. Right. If there's some evidence to support, well, I guess you'd need more than some. You'd need evidence to support that a jury would probably have found, if you apply a harmless error rule, that they would have probably found more than 10 percent. And because we don't know what a jury would decide, Judge, and respectfully, I've said this before, but because we don't know what the jury would decide in this set of facts, and we are entitled to a jury trial on the percentage finding as the statute requires, then we say the harmless error rule in this particular case shouldn't apply. Okay. But I just want to make sure. I'm going to give you the opportunity to answer the question that if we don't agree with you, Mr. Simpson, and we say that we're going to look to that rule, where are we going to find probable harm? Particularly in light of what Justice O'Neill pointed out, they took a dollar-for-dollar credit. Well, I really don't think the dollar-for-dollar credit has any effect upon the percentage responsibility. Okay. So we're not going to be able to find probable harm, then we need to follow the Castile rule in order to rule your way. Is that your answer? That's my answer. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions? Thank you, counsel. The court is ready to hear argument from respondents. Thank you, Mr. Court. This is Bill Weiker. I'm the attorney for the respondents. May it please the court, I do want to emphasize that, as was said to the Court of Appeals, geography is not an issue here. Their position is if this had happened at St. Joseph, they would not be responsible. Well, let's talk about geography real quick. Can you address something that hasn't been talked about yet, and that's their public policy argument? If we were to say that corporations can't be responsible for residents and draw a distinction there, what does that do to programs that benefit rural communities where they need this sort of joint enterprise? I'd like for you to address the public policy. Yes, and what they're asking here should go to the legislature because it is a policy question, and the legislature has considered that. The legislature has passed a number of acts which give special treatment to rural areas, to charitable associations, 
CPMF is, is, a, uh, is a good example of that. They simply have not extended those protections to a private residency program, a private hospital. And I think it is important to note that when we use the terms hospital and doctor and education program, we use them in a different context than, it, it, than we normally think of. This hospital was, didn't, wasn't uh, doing something in its traditional role of a hospital. It is a private business. It decided it wanted to have another business on the side, and that business was going to be a residency program. And it's big business. It means it brings in a lot of income. It brings in a lot of benefits. So they're not acting in the traditional role of a hospital when they deter decide to have a private residency and program. And so is that benefit enough, you would say, to outweigh the argument that this will squelch this type of program? The benefit is such that even though they can be held liable vicariously for actions of their residents, the economic incentive is great enough to where it won't put a hamper on these programs. Absolutely. Absolutely. Just like private schools and public schools. Private schools find that it can be a very profitable thing, so we're going to, even though they don't have all the protections of a public school, a private hospital may want a business, to, a residency business, because it brings a lot of prestige. It brings a lot of doctors. It brings a lot of business to them. It brings a lot of Medicare money to them. Okay, Mr. Whitehurst, let's uh, let... The jury said that this resident was an employee of St. Joseph's, and yes. let assume that there is some evidence supporting that finding. Then uh, Mr. Simpson says, but then we were entitled to a submission on borrowed servant. Why are they not entitled to a submission on borrowed servant? Because PJC says that you're not entitled to that if there's evidence of joint control. And that was the evidence in this case that was argued in the jury so found. In five different ways the jury found that there was joint, in four different ways they found that uh, there was joint control. In other words, you, you, don't, you don't submit so a So this is a co-employer issue. Yeah. There's no big deal. It's clearly, the restatement provides that you can be the employee of two different entities at the same time. Then how is that affected by the contract that says that as to providing the actual clinical activity uh, the hospital does not retain control to govern that. Well, it really doesn't say that, Your Honor. Uh, you're, you're talking about the mutual consent language in the contract between CTMF and the I city? I guess that's it. It's something about it will not control the day-to-day -day medical decisions. Well, first of all, they, they do, as a matter of fact, they do have the right to control the medical decisions of residents. Uh, that's given to them and required to by, by the, uh, uh, the Accreditation Council of Graduate Medical Education. How do they do that? They, they do it through uh, doctors, through uh, attending doctors. Uh, and they have a very sophisticated system. It is the only system, by the way. And, and that's why it but is they, important. But can they tell the attending doctor uh, yeah. what medical care to give? Well, in, in this instance, they had supervisory, uh, the doctor, Dr. Harshaw, served at the pleasure of St. Joseph's Hospital. Yes, he was a but, part of that enterprise. But uh, the argument is that you, that, that I think it goes sort of across the board. You can't tell a, a, the, a, a real physician, the hospital can't tell the physician what kind of medical care to, to render. Is that? Well, uh, it, it's not the control over the particular item, it's control over the agent. Let, let's take uh, an airline's example. You know, the CEO at American Airlines can't tell the pilot who has a, uh, a special license when to put the landing gear down or when to stay on glide slope or when to apply uh, power or to take off power. But no one would even think that you couldn't be, that that the CEO or that the corporation couldn't be liable for the conduct of the, uh, of the pilot. The restatement says that licensure Licensure is not a determinative of employment. I, and, that's what I don't follow. Okay. If, the, if it had been the doctor, Dr. Harbaugh, or whatever his name was, Harbaugh, I can't remember his Harshaw? name. Harshaw? Harshaw. Yes. If it had been his own negligence that had caused this, this these horrible injuries, you couldn't hold St. Joseph liable for that because they don't have the control over the way this patient is treated, do they? Well, they have, con they have more control over the resident than they have over Dr. But you, Harshaw. Under Texas law, they could not be held vicariously liable for that doctor's actions because they don't have the requisite control. Well, they may well be because it is a residency program. Not for example, like this doctor. doctor. Yes, even this doctor. See, for Dr. Harshaw, for example, Dr. Harshaw testified that he is an employee of CPMF. CPMF is an organization that also has residency programs, and it is the integrated part of this program. The resident had nothing to do with this. I'm saying Dr. Harshaw did it. His employer, his employer, he actually has two 
the question would be whether he has two employers. His employer, CPMF, could be held liable. Yes. Because he is an employee. But they're all physicians, and that's understood. They are all physicians. They can be liable for their partner's negligence. But as to, he may be an independent contractor, and we didn't, you know, we really didn't go into his, all of his contacts or what St. Joseph provides him. But if he's an independent contractor, he would not be responsible. Very different from the residents who are hired and fired, paid a salary by St. Joseph. But the agreement specifically provides that St. Joseph Hospital will not control the details of the medical tasks performed by the residents when they are assigned to Dr. Harp, whatever his name is, group. So how do you get around that part of the agreement? It says it can be done with mutual consent. There's evidence in this record that there was lots of mutual consent. They had... Where was the evidence of mutual consent about the tracheotomy on this patient? Well, not on this particular patient, and, you know, not on a particular landing in an airline. It's simply you don't have it over a particular event, perhaps, but you have it over the agent. The same with a pizza delivery person who has an accident. He's not a physician, and there's no prohibition against Pizza Hut delivering pizzas through their agents. We've got a problem with the corporate hospitals directing physicians how to deliver services to patients. And I'm having trouble seeing how, since he was in charge of the resident, and he would not be directly... The hospital couldn't be held liable for his negligence. Why is it, since he was in charge of the resident, the hospital should be liable for what the resident did? Well, he was not totally in charge of this patient. Dr. Villafani was in charge of this patient as well. Under that physician's supervision? Well, under that physician's supervision and under other residents' supervision. Who were also under the group's supervision. Well, but also under St. Joseph's supervision. But not as the details of patient care. That's what I'm having trouble with. Well, it's the question on the education program. The education program is patient care. This isn't like medical school. This is a residency program. Ninety-nine percent of the education is patient care. They have the right for a resident to tell him how long the incision's going to be, what patients he can work on, what patients he can't, what procedures he can do, what procedures he cannot do. They can tell him whether he's going to go on rotation at this facility or that facility, that he can't work anyplace else, that he works 60 to 100 hours and he makes all his money from them. They have total control, total control over the resident. And that's why I emphasize that we're not talking about a doctor in the traditional sense and we're not talking about a hospital in the traditional sense and we're not even talking about education in the traditional sense. Here we have the, as Dr. Nadelson said, there's more control over residents than in any other area of medicine. And that's by the program and that's dictated also by the accreditation requirements. And I hear your argument, but it's very close to arguing that the attending physician is in the same position and any physician in the hospital is in the same position. No, not at all, Your Honor, because we distinguish, and the law does distinguish, between a doctor in private practice who has staff privileges and a doctor who is an employee of the institution. And that's a question on Dr. Harshaw. I think he, the question would be whether he is simply a doctor who has staff privileges or is he an employee of the enterprise. And I think he clearly is an employee of the enterprise because everyone agrees in this case, it's not disputed, that Dr. Harshaw was an employee of CTMF. So if there is a joint enterprise between St. Joseph and CTMF, then St. Joseph would be responsible for Dr. Harshaw's work as long as it was done in the course of scope. So all doctors now, and not just residents, but all physicians who participate in residency programs in an oversight function are now going to subject the teaching hospitals to vicarious liability as well. No, it depends on whether they're employees or not. Dr. Harshaw is the only employee of CTMF. But his group is an independent contractor with the hospital. He's not an employee of the hospital. No, it's separate from the hospital. But Dr. Harshaw is an employee of CTMF who had the joint enterprise with St. Joseph. And that's my point. Under your theory, your joint enterprise theory, not only are we subjecting hospitals to liability for residents, but we are also subjecting them to vicarious liability for physicians with staff privileges if they're involved in a residency program. Not necessarily. It depends on their connection with the residency program. If they're an employee, such as Dr. Harshaw, yes. 
If they're not an employee, perhaps not. You'd have to look at the analysis. Well, What's important where, is that we do the analysis. That's where my confusion may come in. I, the, uh, the Chief just asked Mr. Simpson the question, if, if there's evidence supporting the jury finding that Belfonte, I guess, was the employee of St. Joseph's, then yes. the only inquiry we, we, we move on to is whether or not a hospital can be liable for a doctor employee's negligence under respondeat superior right. uh, theories and the response was borrowed servant. You said, oh, but in this type of circumstance, even if it's borrowed servant, they still had enough control that we don't worry about borrowed servant. I'm a little bit confused when we talk about the right of control and the reliance on the existence of a joint enterprise and the evidence in this case of joint enterprise, assume that the resident is not an employee of St. Joseph, but St. Joseph entered into a mutual arrangement with CT, CTMF. CTMF to provide it with a residency issue, and it transfers all the right of control to CTMF for the medical <coughs> services that are being provided. It seems to me that if the court concludes that this is a joint enterprise, the hospital gets a benefit from the residency program. CTMF gets residents to provide medical care. Money is exchanged back and forth. That in that circumstance, every doctor who has staff privileges with a hospital would could subject the hospital to vicarious liability because all the policies the exchange of money, the mutual benefit, the serving of patients, the access to doctors, all apply in that circumstance as well. Clearly, we not, your, clearly not, Your Honor. That would be expanding it far, much further than the law has done. And this case, in this court, recently in Texas Department of Transportation versus Able, sets out the guidelines for determining whether there's a joint enterprise. And all we simply say is that you, in this case, you apply the regular uh, rules, the regular analysis the traditional analysis of a joint enterprise. What control does St. Joseph have? As, assuming you've got a contract that says the day-to-day -day medical services is delegated to CTMF. The hospital doesn't retain that. Mm -hmm. So that's, that control is not retained. What other factors here does, would distinguish this from the usual doctor using a hospital to treat patients? The hospital has no control over the doctor's medical decision. We've generally said that's why the doctor is independent and the hospital is not vicariously liable. In this case, the hospital says we don't have control and have a contract to say we don't have control over the doctor's decision. How, how, where do we draw the distinguishing? They, they still control the agent. He is still acting in the course and scope of his employment to St. Joseph's. And it really I, is the employment. The employment issue, the resident working for St. Joseph, is really the key to this case. I, I, I do think it's very important, Your Honor. I, I think it's uh, because they're saying he's an independent contractor, and we're saying he's an employee. Uh, and, and it is important. I, I think you could decide this case clearly on the fact that uh, he's an employee, and there's evidence, some evidence, it's certainly found by the jury, and there is plenty of evidence, that they, were, uh, they had a joint employee situation. He had not abandoned in going up to uh, to uh, coming up to Austin, he had not abandoned the work of St. Joseph. To the contrary, he was acting in the course and scope of that in the very pro uh, the very process of it. Mr. Rikers, then, do you agree with, when, when Chief Justice Phillips asked uh, Mr. Simpson if we did, if do we need to reach the joint venture issue in this case, joint enterprise issue, rather? You, you do not need to reach the joint enterprise. You don't need to reach any other issue other than that he was an employee. And, and the second step to that is that the uh, jury found some evidence of joint control or joint employment. And is, is it then that the, the joint control, the, the answer to question number seven, that then takes care of your argument that the borrowed servant issue need not have been submitted? Yes. But also, actually, I, let me take that back. Okay. Employment alone can decide this. I think Justice Phillips is right. Uh, employment alone can determine this. Well, but, but then... Mr. Simpson comes back and says, yes, but then we should have been able to have borrowed servants so we could have transferred him over to the other entity. And but so it was, I just yeah, want to tie yeah. up that, have, give you the opportunity to tie up that question. It, it is certainly not error to not submit it because there was evidence of joint control. Furthermore, the, the jury found joint control. Okay. Would you go to, now to the, to the question of the failure to submit the driver's proportionate responsibility to the jury that 
everyone seems to agree that the trial court should have submitted it. Apparently the Court of Appeals thought that. Why shouldn't we reverse because of that error? Well, there's two reasons. One, when we talk about a doctor-patient relationship, the doctor takes the patient as they're presented. It's never been the law in Texas that if you're in a one-car accident and you're going too fast and you roll over and hurt yourself and you present yourself to a doctor, that the doctor in a malpractice case is entitled to submit your negligence. He takes the patient as the patient's presented. The standard of care does not change on what caused the patient to be there. The same is true as to the other defendant drivers. The doctor should not be entitled to a reduction in its degree of responsibility or the degree of requirement that it maintain the proper standard of medical care any more in that instance than he would with the patient. But the law is that it doesn't run both ways. The driver, the negligent driver, is liable for 100 percent of the damages, including the malpractice damages. It doesn't run conversely. The doctor, of course, is not liable for the damages caused by the driver. But we'll never know how much the jury would have apportioned to the driver, and therefore the driver would have been liable for all of the malpractice damages plus the damages the driver caused. And how do we know how the jury would have answered that question? Judge Hart was very careful in trying this case. This case was tried as a medical malpractice case. He limited the damages to the malpractice. Since this defendant might not have been liable for the nurse's negligence, for example, if the percentages were different. It may be that they're only liable for the damages found attributable to them. If there had been a large percentage of negligence found on the driver, that could have changed the whole apportionment of the damages and the joint and several liability. For them to have been harmed, they would have had to find that Dr. Villafani was less than 10 percent responsible for the malpractice damages and that the drivers were more than 90 percent responsible for the malpractice damages. And I think that's improbable. And first, we should not permit that. That shouldn't be the analysis in a medical malpractice case. It's not like we have a third party. It's not like we have a subsequent impact issue. We have a medical doctor who is contracting with a sick patient. But we also have a statute that says how these are submitted. But the statute... And common law on how who's responsible for what and why shouldn't we follow that. The statute is not applied blindly, and the Cooper case is a good example of that. In fact, in this case, they argued that we ought to submit the negligence of all settling parties, even though there was no evidence of any negligence on any other medical provider. There were other medical providers part of the settlement. The law, the Third Court of Appeals has determined that, no, if there's no evidence, even though the statute says you submit all settling parties, if there is no evidence, then you don't submit them. But there's evidence here of negligence on the part of the doctor. Well, that's right. I use that as an example by saying we don't follow the statute blindly. And certainly, I would ask the court to look at the relationship that a doctor has with his patient. How do we know what the jury would have found had this case been submitted? We don't know, Your Honor, what the jury would have said if we had submitted percentages. So how can we presume that there's no harm? I think we can look at the fact that on the damages of malpractice, on the issue of malpractice, that it would have been highly unlikely that they would have found the drivers 90 percent responsible for the malpractice. But even if he's only 10, 50 percent responsible, he's liable for all of those damages. The doctor's liable for all of them regardless. That's my point. It would not have made any difference in the outcome of the case. But he says we don't even get to do a harm analysis because it's per se reversible error. So the discussion about what they could or couldn't have found doesn't enter into it. The law is like he says in Exxon v. Perez and Hyundai v. Rodriguez seem to indicate if you didn't submit a defensive theory that you were entitled to on the evidence, that's a reversible error, period. And I respectfully disagree with that, Your Honor. Rule 44. That's the question I ask him under the trap rule. It says you have to find that it led to the entry of an improper judgment. He said that doesn't apply because. Well, our position, of course, is that it does apply. Certainly it applies. Can a resident be an independent contractor? 
It would be very unlikely uh, under the rules that the uh, Accreditation Council of Graduate Medical Education uh, require of uh, sponsoring institutions for them to be anything but an employee. And that, by the way, has been recognized by uh, Edgar and Sales in their treatise and also in Dobbs' treatise, the, the uh, uh, old, uh, used to be Prosser and, and Keaton is now Dobbs. They, they both recognize that residents are employees of the sponsoring institution. So in your view, <coughs> uh, basically, if a hospital wanted to have a residency program, it's got to be liable for their misconduct. Well, not all hospitals, uh, just private hospitals. Uh, oh, yeah. and, and, and that's, again, uh, Since is that, uh, uh, well, that, that's, again, up to the legislature as to whether they want to provide that protection. And, and also, uh, I, I believe uh, we need to point out on public policy. Stacy Wolf and her parents uh, were not told that she was a teaching patient. They were not told that the doctor who was treating her was in training. And they provided uh, $5 million worth of coverage for their nurses, but only $200,000 for these uh, trainees, uh, and didn't tell the patients. Now, that's public policy. Who is they? St. Joseph's Hospital. And, and so that's why the, that issue should be before the legislature, so we can look at all to say, if we're, going to put, if we're going to change and give special privileges to private hospitals in residency programs, we need to look at other uh, rules that ought to be in place at the same time. Was there any other coverage that covered this resident besides St. Joseph's $200,000 no. limits? No. Any other questions? Thank you, Council. Thank you. Let me just mention Nurse Harris was an employee of Brackenridge Hospital and was not part of St. Joseph Hospital uh, in this uh, situation. Uh, unless tell me, tell me, I missed that. Tell yeah, me that again. Nurse, nurse Harris, the oh. nurse who was submitted, was an employee of Brackenridge Hospital. St. Joseph Hospital didn't provide insurance coverage for, uh, for Nurse Harris. Uh, unless, uh, Justice Enoch, I think you're correct in some ways that, that joint enterprise here in this case is really, it's a really an attempt to bootstrap uh, employment status uh, into a joint enterprise uh, every time it's mentioned that Dr. Villafani is St. Joseph Hospital there in the hospital. The reason we say there's no employment relationship here on the facts of this case is because there is no right of control in St. Joseph Hospital. It's really not a delegation situation. Well, it's not that St. Joseph has the right to practice medicine that it delegated to CTMF, which is a physician service organization that's authorized to practice but there is some medicine. But do you agree that there is some evidence to support the jury's answer to questions six and seven, which are the employment issues? Uh, no, because there is so no right of control. Uh, by so there's statute, no there's no there's, right of control. There, there is no evidence. The, the way you've, those you, you've raised no challenge to the sufficiency of the evidence to support those two particular findings. We've attacked in all respects any agency theory in this case on the ground that there is no right of control, and right of control is something that is essential to each one of the agency e issues that have been submitted. Well, the jury, now, are you saying that there's no right of control as a matter of law because of the statute? Saying, yes, we're saying that, plus by virtue of the contracts that exist, there was no right of control by St. Joseph Hospital to control medical care that took place in Brackenridge so, Hospital. So then your position is that at trial you established as a matter of law no right of control. That's is correct. Is that your position as opposed to taking the position that the plaintiff failed to put on any evidence of right of control? As a matter of law in our legal sufficiency, insufficiency challenge embraced the concept of evidence can't be considered because of legal rules. And our position is the, the well, corporate wait, wait, practice well, of medicine Wait, you just lost me for a minute there. Okay. Say that again. Our legal su insufficiency challenge in included not only a failure of making evidence, but also that the rules of law preclude evidence having any uh, uh, effect uh, or being ma material. We also challenge the materiality of all the findings well, because in our position, the statutory prohibition makes all of these findings immaterial. Okay, well, you've just thrown a whole bunch of stuff into the, into the basket. Okay. What would be, to. on this issue, if we were to, if we were to agree with you, what, what issue would our opinion lead with and what would the answer be? The opinion would lead with the determination that in this case, St. Joseph Hospital had no right to control and in fact is barred by Texas statute from having any right to control
the patient care that took place in Brackenridge Hospital by Dr. Villafani. As a matter of law. As a matter of law. Okay, that would, that would be what it would look like. That would and be. so to be clear on that, just as I asked Mr. Whitehurst, uh, can a resident ever be a independent contractor? He says probably not. In your view, a uh, hospital could never be liable for a resident, even if the resident was on the premises uh, and an employee of the hospital. With respect to medical care, with respect to the provision of medical care and exercise of medical judgment, that's correct. Okay. Now, Mr. Well, Simpson, let me go one step further. Let me take this one step further. You agree that the resident was an employee? There is evidence to support an employee finding for some purposes. I understand, but, but, but you agree but that you, no, you, you agree you agree that he's an employee, and correct of St. Joseph's. If, if you were in Houston, for instance, and had a car wreck driving, an, is he an employee of St. Joseph's? For some purposes, he is an employee. Is he an employee? Not. I, I understand you've got a qualification, and I'm not okay. going to take your answer. Yes. As not as there is limited, evidence to support employee. employment relationship. So if we and under general principles of agency law in Texas and principles of vicariously liable, uh, vicarious liability. An employer is liable for the acts and omissions of their employee committed within the course and scope of employment, correct? Yes. yes. Okay, now, if that's the case, then aren't you asking us to then create a special rule with respect to this kind of fact situation, which would mean you're an employee, but we're not going to imply, apply usual agency and vicarious liability principles. Is that is that kind of how the issue boils down in this case, which is why we, when you talk about the statute and various other things, is that what you're trying to ask us to decide? Yes, if the okay. statute will prohibit okay. any right of control. So this, part the, of the definition this fact situation is then going to be an exception to the usual Texas law on employment and agency relationships because of the statute? Yes. Okay. Let me ask you, you know, I'm not sure I understand how residents, how this works. You say the hospital shouldn't be liable because they don't have the right to control the details of the patient care. As I understand it, the resident is not a licensed physician. No, the resident is a licensed mm -hmm. physician. In fact, Dr. Dr. Villafani was licensed in 1991. But there's some, got to be somebody supervising in the areas in which they're trying to be certified. He's receiving additional training. Uh, and in order for him to be board certified and a specialist in surgery, then he needs to go through a residency program, but he is fully authorized by the state of Texas to practice medicine uh, in this state and to treat patients. So he doesn't need to have any additional licensure. So he can perform surgery even though he's not board certified? <laughs> no hospital. Uh, my point it depends is upon the, whether the hospital itself grants privileges to somebody to, to my point is perform surgery out there, in that circumstance. Somebody is expected to be supervising these residents, and in fact they are supervised. That's correct, and there's no complaint in this case. Who should be liable for their negligence vicariously? If it's not the hospital, then who should be liable vicariously? Well, there should be no one vicariously liable for their conduct because they are independent doctors performing medical services. Except Certainly, everybody in the medical community recognizes they shouldn't be performing these services without some sort of supervision. That's one reason why there's a requirement that attending physicians be there uh, and participate in the patient care. An attending physician, as Dr. Harshaw, is also going to be called upon to discuss his participation in this patient's care and whether his standards were sufficient. Should he be vicariously liable sufficient. for the resident's negligence? I'm not aware of any legal doctrine that makes, certainly within CTMF, uh, which is a collection of physicians, it's an organization that, uh, that is able to practice medicine, CTM itself can be liable for any one of the doctors in their group's conduct. So that is a principle of vicarious liability expressly authorized by Texas statute that allows a physician service organization to practice medicine because it's Why controlled totally by doctors. Why should they be doctors. liable for the negligence of the residents that they're supervising? because it is a, they are employing the residents and they are all doctors. They, it is a special type of organization uh, that is made up and controlled by doctors. Actually, it's an arm of the Travis County Medical Society. So if I'm injured by a resident, the only person I can look to is the resident. I can't look to the hospital. I can't look to the doctors who supervise them. Well, you cannot look to the hospital for vicarious liability. You can look to the supervising doctors who may themselves have committed medical negligence in the care of the case. Uh, if it's an ostensible agency situation, uh, you may be able to bring that theory uh, as far as the resident. Uh, but the physician-patient situation is much different. The CEO of American Airlines can sit in the con cockpit uh, and can say fly around this thunderstorm or fly through this thunderstorm. But when we get to provision of medical care by doctors, we have special policies recognized by statute and by the courts of this state 
that says we're not going to allow corporations to control the practice of medicine necessarily. They cannot be liable for vicariously for the medical conduct. They can only be liable for their own direct conduct. Any other questions? Thank you, Counsel. Thank you. That concludes the arguments for today, and the Marshal will now adjourn the court.